Good morning, everybody. Uh, lovely to see in the chat people talking about the weather in their local areas. I think it's freezing, but it's bright and sunny. So that's good for me. My name's Claire Murphy and I'm the clinical lead for BOC. And I'm going to just introduce to you our presenters uh, for today's session. So uh, first of all, we've got Mr. Niall Farrow. He was previously the senior team lead in Harlow for East of England and is now the operational manager for East Midlands. So a lot of you will be familiar with him. Um, and then we've got, we're very grateful to have uh, Essex Fire Brigade supporting us again with our education events. So we've got Claire, forgive me Claire if I say your surname wrong, Magok. Um, and Claire's going to deliver a fantastic presentation um, which includes um, a device on misting for our high risk patient. We then got uh, Paul Pemberton and Kieran Wah, who presented for us last year to also deliver some updates for us on the fire service. And uh, lastly, but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Anita Segal, who's joining us from the Royal Free in London to talk to us about nasal high flow therapy, latest research and the COPD population as well. Thank you, Joe. So to look at the presenters topics um, in detail, we've got Niall delivering the life of the cylinder, looking at the carbon footprint, but also looking at the history of oxygen and the cylinder um, and BOC essentially. And then Claire will be talking about safe and well, the cost of living and portable misting units. Um, we've then of course got Anita who's delivering the domiciliary nasal high flow in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So that's your agenda for today's session. I'm just going to take this moment to do a little plug for those of you that are on here from the east of England. Um, last week or was it the week before we had our first clinical network meeting um, which was really really um, a brilliant kickoff meeting and I'm just going to promote it for others in the east of England who want to join the next one it will be on the 8th of November at 10 a.m. The topics we're looking at are developing working parties to look at education, and that's really benchmarking clinicians training. Um, we're looking at data and we're also looking at policies across the board. So if you want to be a part of the clinical network, pencil that in on the 11th of November, drop me an email and I will forward the invite to you as well. That's my little plug for the East. East Midlands, you've got your own clinical network, so you're fine. OK, moving on, Joe, to the next slide. And now I hand over to um, Niall to present his Life of the Cylinder. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Claire said, uh, I'm Niall. I'm the Operations Manager for East Midlands. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the cylinders, really. A little bit of a, a history of the company and a bit of a history of um, like how, how cylinders came to be. Um, and then, and then what, what sort of like the future holds really for um, the modality? Um, I'm not going to move things along. So yeah, talk about the past, where we are currently, how that oxygen is manufactured, uh, and then what the future might look like. So just a bit of a history of BOC really. Um, in 1886, those two French brothers, uh, they were Arthur and Leon Brin. And they formed Brin's Oxygen Company um, and they were sort of travelling workmen uh, and they came to the UK uh, and they'd um, devised a method for separating oxygen from the atmosphere. Um, two years after the formation of their company, they were producing about 28,000 cubic metres of oxygen per year. So that's half an Olympic swimming pool, um, which is, you know, it, it is an important stat for later on. Um, and at the time, uh, oxygen wasn't used in the medical setting. Uh, it was actually used uh, in limelight. So the oxygen helped burn lime, um, which was formerly used in theatres. So when they say, you know, in the limelight, we actually burnt lime to create those theatre lights. So that was the primary use of oxygen uh, back in those days. Um, and before cylinders existed, uh, oxygen can only be stored in a gas bag. Um, so this was ineffective. It led to a constant loss of product. Um, you couldn't carry the high volume, so there was a loss of profit constantly. Uh, and so work went underway to develop a cylinder, 
Um, and they started off with iron cylinders. Uh, obviously, they were incredibly heavy, uh, far more expensive than the product they held. Um, but in 1890s or in 1890, the Brins Oxygen Company introduced the first ever steel cylinder, um, which is the, still the type of cylinder we use today. Um, we use aluminium as well, but yeah, we still have steel cylinders in circulation. Um, it was also in 1890 that a Brins oxygen cylinder was first used in a medical setting, and that was in Australia. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've been doing this for quite a oh, where's my presentation gone? Has that disappeared? There we go. Um, <clears throat> Joe, what's going on? Hello, no. someone, was, someone was messaging me, so I just tried to see what it was about in case it was urgent. We can Please see. Carry on. Yeah, we can okay, see your back. presentation. Right, I've, yeah. I've got it back. <clears throat> so, in 1900, converting air into a liquid form, which is the way we uh, get our oxygen today, had been pioneered and painted by uh, a Dr. Carl von Lindy. Um, the first application of this was in refrigeration gases. So, your modern day fridge came from uh, this gentleman here. Um, and the first company to snap him up uh, was the Brins Oxygen Company. <clears throat> um, obviously a very clever man, very popular around the world. So there's, there ended up being sort of three or four companies with his namesake on them. And actually in 2006, uh, BOC, who were uh, originally a, a Lindy company, merged with another Lindy company. Um, <clears throat> But in 1906, Brins Oxygen Company formally becomes the British Oxygen Company or BOC as we know it today. Um, so that that is the history. That's how, that's how we came about to be doing what we do. Um, all cylinders, all medical oxygen starts life as fresh air. So it's you know that's our most precious commodity. It's free. It costs us nothing. It's it's in the air all around us, obviously. Um, and BOC still uses the principles derived by Dr. Von Lindy to this day, just only on a far more industrial scale. So the way we get our air is we process it at a number of air separation unit sites. We call these ASUs. Um, there's eight of these in the UK. Um, however, only four of them are used to produce the, uh, the product that goes into the home care oxygen stream. Now, these are strategically located around the country on large customer sites, typically refineries, and that's because we pipeline so much gas into these places that it would be daft to have miles of pipeline when we can only have 100 yards worth. So we're quite symbiotic with the, you know, with, with our customer sites, um, which makes maintaining and, and keeping hold of contracts very crucial. Um, so this is an overview of one of our air separation unit sites. This will process 80,000 meters cubed an hour, uh, which is the equivalent of, um, the, 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 I think I've got the wrong presentation. Yeah. That's not, do you, do you need us to swap over Niall? No, no, I just I had the bit in there about um, the, what, because it was some like 30 swim, swim, Olympic swimming pools an hour, wasn't it? But I just realised if that bit's missing, my other slides have been missing. Um, well, I've added it to the other one. Joe could swap it over if you want. I will swap it over. Bear with just a second. Yeah, please do. Sorry. When we rehearsed this yesterday, Niall gave um, an interesting fact about the size. And I said, you need to put it into layman's terms for me. So rather than 80,000 cubic metres, I wanted to know what was the equivalent in swimming pools, because that's the way visually I could grasp it. So Niall's done that bit of homework um, on the slides that Joe's now swapping over to. I believe it was something like 32 swimming pools. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. While we're just doing that as well, I just want to introduce in the background when you've got any questions it they may be answered by the presenters or you may also get answers from uh, James Phillips who's our east of England operational manager um, oh or you 
more <laughs> thanks James <laughs> or you may get answers from Julie Owens who's our respiratory advisor in the East Midlands and some of you may have had contact with her in the East over the summer period okay Joe hey. is this the new one yeah thank, thank you Joe my pleasure uh, feel free to request <clears throat> control uh, Niall uh, sorry yeah apologies for uh, for that so initially the BOC company was um, processing about half an Olympic swimming pool a year. We're now processing 32 Olympic swimming pools an hour uh, and you can multiply that by eight for each of our sites. So, you know, we've been, we're massively industrial now. Uh, it's still not moving. Why is it not moving? Excellent. So an ASU site, the way this works is we just have a big hole in the wall. Uh, it's, that's quite literally it. It uh, uses a differential in pressure to pull the air in. So all of our air that we process just comes through this hole in the wall, uh, at which point we begin to compress it and cool it on an industrial scale. Pressurised air is cooled in a column uh, and these gases boil off at cryogenic temperatures, so it's super cooled. Um, oxygen uh, boils off at minus 196. So there's three layers within here. Uh, your nitrogen will come out in one stream, your argon will come off in another stream, and your oxygen will come off somewhere else. And they're all sent off for further compression um, and, and storage as liquid. This process uses 18.5 megawatts, and that is the equivalent to constantly boiling 11,000 kettles. Um, and all of these, all of these ASUs are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we're only able to shut them down once every two years for maintenance, so they they run constantly. Um, BOC, because of this, is one of the top five energy consumers in the UK. And just another interesting fact: there's no manning on these sites, so we have um, a remote centre up in Yorkshire. So all the operators sit in a control room hundreds of miles away from the, the pit of machinery they're working and they just run it remotely. Once we've got our liquid product, these tankers will drive them around the country, delivering them to production sites. Um, so we'll have a, a tanker filled with liquid oxygen. We have large storage tanks on site, so we store it in liquid form, um, super cooled at the sites. Um, we do condense it and then we start pumping it into cylinders. It's a manual process. Um, it's, uh, yeah, you know, we have operators working 24 seven. They fill them all by hand. They do all the quality checks by hand. They do all the, the cylinder testing by hand. Um, and each cylinder is checked manually. The cylinders are loaded onto our transport fleet and overnight they're distributed to our home care sites, which we normally sit on um, a transport distribution hub. So at this point, the cylinder, the oxygen, you know, we've used an incredible amount of energy to get that in there. We've then, you know, already done some significant miles just to get it to point of distribution. Um, and then further from that, you know, our home care teams each month uh, we'll deliver roughly 800,000 cylinders a year annually, um, which is a staggering number of cylinders. Um, and then this equates to 60 to 70,000 miles driven per month in both of the England regions. Uh, it's a lot of miles. Um, so what, what's next for us? Well, obviously our partners within the NHS have committed to reaching an 80% CO2 reduction by 2028 and to hit net zero by 2045. Um, and BOC as a company falls under this umbrella. Um, so we've committed to meeting that uh, requirement as well. And currently serving one ambulatory cylinder patient produces around 589 kilograms of CO2 per year. Um, so it's not a very green operation as it stands. So there's a lot of work for us to be doing. Um, so what we're we doing? Well, first off, we're looking at green driving. Um, so our home care drivers have all been through a focused driving course. We have telematics fitted to their vehicles, which we use to monitor and main safe, maintain a safe standard of driving. We have regular debriefs with our drivers 
uh, and we use this. We look at their routes and we establish be best practices. Um, and that's working. So in 2022 so far, our fuel usage has been comparable to 2021. Um, however, the mileage disparity is we've been able to go twice more around the globe. So where we've been busier post COVID, um, we've still used the same amount of fuel as we did on the previous year. Uh, and we've actually managed to get two trips around the world in extra mileage just through green driving. So those commitments are working. Um, obviously, we're, we're still progressing, still working. Um, but we've got an example here on the left. Um, this is one of my drivers. So they're scored out of 10. And our commitment is to get them at a solid seven or eight. Um, so we measure their speed in, their driving events, so if they're hitting potholes really hard, that kind of thing whether they're idling their engine, um, the fuel consumption, so that's how well they're driving. Uh, green speed is, you know, not over over revving, things like that. Maintaining a constant speed, um, coasting up to roundabouts and things like that and making sure they're gear shifting effectively. So this guy, Brett, he's uh, doing really well. Um, obviously, I've used a good example. <laughs> I'm not going to use a bad one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of work going on there um, and we shall continue to do so. So what's next? Well, we've committed to getting all of our passenger car drivers um, in home care onto electric vehicles by the end of 2023. Um, so that that's happening and we are in talks uh, and open discussions to trial hydrogen vehicles, which if we're successful would mean our fleet when our fleet lease expires. We could be a zero emissions fleet. And the other thing we're looking at is new technologies. Um, so POC, you know, portable oxy oxygen concentrators are the first major innovation in medical gases since the 1800s. Like the ability to have that miniature air separation unit, like with a battery over your shoulder, very portable. Um, it's, it's huge and the impact of having a POC is massive. Um, so one POC patient generates 45 kilograms of CO2 per year in comparison to the 589 of one ambulatory patient. We're also in talks with, like I've said, with, with the suppliers of hydrogen vehicles. The reason for that is um, currently an electric vehicle isn't suitable because of the payload, the weight of the cylinders. Uh, we're unable to get distance to payload ratios. Um, however, if we had a, a better uptake on the POC, then we might be able to explore electric vehicles as well. Um, currently, the rest of Europe has a 60% uptake on the POC and we're, we're sat behind that. So um, I, I believe, you know, just for a greener future, there's, there's better to come. Uh, and just one other thing, I've got a little prop. Sorry for reaching over. So all of our cylinders have to have a tamper evidence seal. So it looks like this. Um, these are recycled, but it's still plastic waste. We can't guarantee what streams it goes into. And like I say, we're delivering 800,000 of these a year. Um, so, you know, if we're worried about our microplastics, um, this is just a, a, another another thing that we could stop. So that's it from me. It is something I feel very passionately about. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask or give me a grilling on, but. Hi. <laughs> oh, there is one. It's me. Um, Niall, just very you? quickly, be, before you um, go again to my questions, can you just return control back to me? I'll switch back over to the main slides. Seeing as it's you, Joe. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, my question, Niall, is um, when you said about the payload and the electric vehicles, yeah. Is that just is that to do with the weight of the cil cylinders? That that's weight of cylinders versus uh, battery capacity. Um, so at the moment there isn't really the hydrogen fueling infrastructure available. Um, so even if we were successful in trialing a vehicle, it's the the infrastructure is not there nationally um, for us to 100% go ahead. Uh, but like I say, we are taking part in trials, but the EV infrastructure is there. Um, it's it's all about getting that payload on the vehicle down to be able to explore the EV option. 
And just one last question um, also to do with the driver risk sort of profiling and, and the scoring. Mm -hmm. What would be a bad one or would the driving course that they have to do really pick up on poor drivers? Um, a, ba a bad one. <laughs> I mean, if you, if we looked back at Brett, so there there was uh, Brett had a, a yellow where he could have been coached, but it was still a good score. Um, anything below seven for me is bad. Um, but if I was starting to say see someone with a score of eight, but they were mostly speeding, I'd, I'd probably pull them up for unsafe driving. Um, but um, so it's all about just rounding off. Really, I'd say seven or eight, but above is good, and anything below seven would be bad for me. And there's a, there's a speed limit they have to do because when I was out with technicians, I was late for a school run, but they yeah. couldn't he couldn't go any faster because it was it was a it was a lower speed than what the speed limit was. That's correct. Yeah. Isn't it? So the vans are limited to um, fifty mile an hour in certain road road regions, even when the um, yeah even when the even when the speed limit's sixty. So right, I've hogged the questions. There must be some questions out there. Whether it's POC, cylinders, I can see carbon some coming footprint. up in the chat. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. If appropriate, you know, how much do these units? Hang on, I'm not, I'm not sure which is the first one. Where are we up to? How does so the one of the POC questions, work? We'll start there. Sorry, I was just going to say one of the questions is: it's should we should we be uh, moving over? Should is it if appropriate? Should we be moving towards portable concentrators rather than cylinders? That's one of the questions. Uh, absolutely, if we can. Obviously, there's the question of patient suitability and the assessment uh, of that patient. Um, so similarly to a conserver, if they can't trigger the POC, then we shouldn't be putting them in. So that that assessment should be done to make sure it's safe for for the patient to use. It is worth noting that, you know, these technologies are constantly growing. So we're looking at a new range of POCs to put into the community. Um, and some of those have even are even more sensitive. So they'll be easier for patients to trigger. So, you know, this technology is new. It's innov innovative. It is growing. Um, and, you know, manufacturers are listening to what the patient requirements are. Um, so it is a constantly evolving uh, beast. Um, where One of the questions next? is, how does the POC work? Katie wants to know okay, how does the POC work. So the way it works is it, it's um, literally we have two chambers in there and they have a mineral in there that's an absorbent mineral called zeolite. Um, and zeolite, uh, they, they can uh, form naturally in volcanic regions, but you can also manufacture a zeolite. It's mainly aluminium and silicon with some other bits and pieces in the compound to make them um, absorbent to what you want them to absorb. Um, so that mineral, the air will go through it and it will hold on to the separate, the, it will separate the different gases within the air. It will compress the oxygen um, and feed that through. So it'll hold it in a pressurized chamber. So it's always able to deliver the prescription with a reserve of oxygen. Um, once one tank has um, sort of used its, itself, it'll, use, it'll move on to the other chamber. It'll then refresh the tank, the, the chamber on the left. So it's constantly switching back and forth the same way that one of your large um, general normal concentrators would work, only in a, in a smaller form. Um, they are battery powered. Those you batteries are I'm rechargeable. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I'm fucking an idiot. Sorry? Who who is that talking in the background? Yeah, Gavin Barker. Can we can everyone just mute theirs unless they're talking, please? Sorry, carry on now. Um, so that was it. Yeah, that's how that works. That's then delivered on a pulse. So there's the patient wears the nasal cannula, um, and that will, uh, as the patient breathes in, that will trigger uh, a pulse dose of the oxygen. Uh, next one, how much they weigh? Um, I think they're around two and a half kilos at the minute, but we are, again, we're looking at sort of seeing it as, as these devices develop and grow lighter, better devices coming in. Um, is the POC, does the POC run on rechargeable batteries? Yes. Oh, 2.4. Thanks, Julie. So I'm just scrolling through the chat now. Um, previously, there was a shortage of POC. Is this now resolved? Um, 
It is, yes. So this is down to this uh, global capacitor shortage. Um, we have struggled with supply. Um, and there's, it's no secret we, we have struggled to get them in. We currently do have a healthy stock of POC. Um, if everybody off this call went and ordered 10, 15, 20 of them, we probably wouldn't anymore. <laughs> so please don't need to it. But yeah, there is currently a good supply of, of POC in the, in the population. Um, so if that was something you wanted to start looking to move towards, um, we can support that. Um, patient says the cylinders aren't always full as this likely. As unlikely, I think we do have a failure rate of something like 0.06%, if I recall, Claire. Um, it's it's an incredibly low failure rate for the volume of yeah. cylinders we get we, we run through. Um, because yeah, we can't is. use our, um, lubricants within the valves, sometimes what happens, especially in colder weather, is we'll get a valve stick at some point and a cylinder will leak a bit. Um, that does happen, but it's a very low failure rate. Uh, it is, it is something we, we can't lubricate. Yeah, no, Sorry, you're spot plan. on. And it's something we monitor as well. So if the failure rate was high, we wouldn't be happy with uh, the product and we'd be feeding back to the provider. But as Niall said, we're currently trialling um, new portable concentrators uh, um, and I'm due to get patient feedback some of these portable concentrators um, are promoting greater sensitivity. So for those patients who, who couldn't get on with them, it might be worth trialing the new products once they're out there for you. Um, I know that Julie answered a question of shortages. We work all the time to, to make sure there's enough amongst the regions, amongst the depots. Um, if there's any problems, just let Julie and myself know and we will try and smooth it over whether we get a device from another area, we would we will sort it out from you as well. Um, last in time, there's a question there, Niall, on how long it lasts. It does depend on the setting. It depends on the setting and the patient, I think, because um, depending how often a patient breathes and triggers. So um, that's something that would be down on a, on a patient by patient basis, um, basically. Um, a, the setting, uh, but B, how often they're breathing and triggering. Um, I actually don't have a chart to hand, uh, which is my own fault, and I apologise for that. I can get back to you on that one. Who was that one for? That was uh, Katie. So I've I've just put in the chat that if she um, gives us her email address, we can pick that up and send her all the spec sheets, so with all the battery settings on there and a specification okay. as well. Now, in terms of cost comparison, um, Charlotte, in the long run, it's actually cheaper for this for the NHS service. Um, once that pox in there, we visit twice a year, once every six months to service and, and that's the patient sort of, you know, that that's it. Whereas if you've got some patient on, say, weekly, um, you know, deliveries, some some patients we go see two, three times a week. Um, that That's a lot of cost, A, in rental, B, in delivery charges that are constantly stacking up. It's um, a good. So, no, yeah, in the long run, POC is cheaper for the service. But remember, all of you as clinicians, you know, you you look at your patient. If you've got somebody who's not a high ambulatory user, you know, you have to do that risk benefit, don't you? Is is POC most suitable or is it better they stick with a cylinder that they're not replenishing very often? So, so just weigh that up. There's a good question here. I don't know if you want to take it now. How accurate is the level of oxygen delivered by the POC? What kind of purity do we look for there? Uh, they sit between 96 and 99, um, the same as the standard concentrators at home. Um, so it's within it's within the tolerances that are allowed. Mm, very, so that's um, really good. Um, yeah. Another question here from Helen. Yeah. Uh, can pot units be returned to you? Yes. So all of our machinery, all of our equipment is returned to us. It does go through a refresh before it's delivered uh, back out to a new patient. So we don't just buy a new pot for each patient um, or a new concentrator. As we see that equipment return through no longer needed, um, we will refresh that, service that, and it goes back out like a brand new machine. There's also a question on when's there likely to be um, another new pot coming out. I'm not aware of them, but we do keep an eye and our colleagues in Europe are normally ahead of the game. So they start 
looking at any new devices out there and making sure they're fit for purpose. So watch this space. I'm sure that the companies will be they're constantly being challenged to deliver something smaller and lighter. Ah, that brings me on to another question that's gone now um, to do with trolleys and the, and the POC. I've never seen a trolley for a portable concentrator. Nile, Julie, have you? No. No. Have you seen one? Sorry, whoever asked that question, have you actually seen a trolley for them? Um, we don't get asked for a trolley often, but it always stands out to me when we are asked. So... I haven't seen one and we, we don't have any trolleys to be able to provide for the portable concentrator. Um, Generally, they're light, they're light because they're so much lighter than cylinders and it comes in a carry bag. You can carry it over your shoulder. That seems to be su sufficient for, for our patients. I can see that um, Ruth has mentioned that he had them with air liquid. What you've got to remember, though, is that um, the old parks were heavier and bigger. The pox now are lighter and smaller, and therefore a bag is more, more effective um, and much easier for patients to use and to be wheeling a trolley around. Yeah, thanks, mm -hmm. Julie. Um, Linny's also got a hand up. Linny, do you want to ask a question? Hi, thanks. Yeah, I see somebody mentioned it was the old G2 that was larger that had a trolley, but we do still encounter issues, even though they are lighter and they do have a shoulder strap for our frailer patients and IPFs who get more breathless um, with the weight of them. So what I, I do sometimes when it's appropriate is um, order them a delta frame. So they trot the three wheel trolley with a pocket yeah. in the base. And that can be really effective and it supports their mobility and their stability. And it also means that they can use the uh, energy and they can be really effective. That's a good point, Lily. And I think Maria Jardim has also put that in the chat as well, just about the frame. Um, Julie Tyler has said about um, a rucksack. I think the only thing with the rucksacks is to make sure that it doesn't um, cover the ventilation ports. Is that right, Niall? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, just gonna. Sorry, sorry. Carry on, Claire. I just don't want to get too ahead of the. Um, go on. No, it's fine. I was just. Um, I don't believe the company issue any rucksacks, so it would be something for us to look into. If people were reporting that as an issue enough, we would we would then look into it. But that's the main thing. If a patient wants to purchase a rucksack, is making sure that those ventilation ports aren't occluded at all because of course that's how the air is going in and it goes through the sift beds and the oxygen back to the patients. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to say as well is um, just uh, there still are some patients buying their own portable concentrators and I, I don't know I think they're about two to three thousand pounds. They really need to be discouraged from that and just going through you guys as specialists to make sure they're assessed and then it's requested from us. The reason for that is what's basic things like maintenance of them, checking the oxygen purity, replacing if, if it's broken down. I still talk about years ago, a patient in the East who had bought their own POC, um, technician was around to service the standard concentrator, the big one. He kindly serviced his bought concert POC concentrator and found it was delivering air to the patient so it was pointless uh, so I just like to bring that up when you've got patients buying their own um Lynn's got a hand up as well now I know you want to move on oh no so there's there's questions in the chat as well and, and the chat sort of evolving so I'm just going to run through the chat if that's okay just to make sure I don't miss anybody um, so Kelly Turner, are there plans to look at the green energy at the SUs? Yes. So it's all renewable energy at the minute. Uh, and obviously, I mean, these these plants cost millions and millions and millions to build, but the, the newer ones um, are the same or are going to be the same as a, a, a concentrator, basically. So we'll have massive industrial plants running off of this um, off of this zeolite -like technology. So, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's. You know, it, it's it's what we're doing is the right thing. But yes, um, where are we up to now? The Dewey Tyler further forward feedback with the alternative pot that was in Mansfield that was trialled. Um, there was an issue with that pot in the way that was calibrated and set up. We brought that back to branch. That was a learning event for us. 
Uh, we brought that back to branch. We reset the calibration of, of, of the POC and it, it was been run for a couple of days now. Absolutely fine. So it was, it was on soak test. Um, so that actual unit is is fine and OK. Um, so what I'll do is I know you were part of that. I'll have a, a little separate debrief with you if you want on that one. I know that had uh, alarmed up a few times for you. Uh, 2.4 cylinder, I think Jim's already put in there that the cylinder's 3.5 kg, is that right, Jim? Yes, that's correct, yep, yeah, for a CD and a Brilliant. DD, and I think it's um, 1.75 yeah. for a ZA. Yeah, so can we get new, Any, anyone who wants new, um, new spec sheets, absolutely, we can get those out. Like I say, um, at the moment, there's no continuous flow pox, uh, but that is, again, that's something that's on our radar of, of things to be looking for. And we are meeting with suppliers. Um, can pox deliver a low flow? No, at the moment. Is that right, Claire? I think we're, we're sat on settings that are. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. We're, 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 it's pulse dose, isn't it? So lowest setting is one. Yeah. Um, Claire, Julie, this would be a question for you. Can they be used with children? Interesting. I, uh, with paediatrics, I always like them to be assessed separately. So I have had uh, a consultant at Addenbrooke's who brought, a, I think it was a three-year-old into clinic and observed her work of breathing and whether she could then trigger the POC. She was happy, confident that the, the child could do it and it was a success. But I, I, as an adult trained nurse, would always want it to come from um, a physician. So, yeah, consultant level, just because I wouldn't be confident to be able to assess that work of breathing on a child. I don't know if um, any children nurses here, whether they think differently or whether they would be confident to do so. But, um, yeah, you could consider it. A couple of comments on air liquid with trolleys. I think they used to use the G2, which did have a trolley. I think we've covered that already. Um, Sharon Hardy's got her do, hand up, Niall. Yeah, I was just getting to the bottom oh, of sorry. the chat. Sorry. Yeah, um, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat. That's just um, chat, chat now. OK, hands up. Who's got hands up? Sharon, Hi, do you like to ask Sharon Hardy. Sharon Hardy. Hello. Hi, it was me that asked the question about the trolleys. Um, OK. Because, <clears throat> so the, the issue that I've always found mostly is that, pa you know, patients complain about the weight and therefore they have the standard trolley in a standard cylinder in a trolley as a, an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, I have had some patients that have purchased trolleys themselves. They've just gone ahead and done that to put their portable in. So they've been able okay. to access. So I, that's why I was asking, why don't we supply a trolley? Um, I'll be honest, I actually haven't seen an energy trolley for uh, the new concentrators. It is, I have made a note that it's going to be on my list of things to start looking into. Um, it'll probably be a bit on a patient by patient basis. We, uh, we wouldn't want to be um, making that as a standard um, for every POC delivery. Um, so, yeah, if we could leave, if we could take that away as an action as something we're going to look at. Yeah, because I, I think, Sharon, them. is it the old ones? Sorry? Are the trolleys for the old Inogens that, that the patients know, These are just patients that have looked on the internet and found a trolley that is suitable to sit it on and pull it around because they just can't carry it. And it's not always um, elderly frail. They might have sort of mechanical issues with their shoulders mm -hmm. or whatever, where they can't actually have the weight of it just on one shoulder. Um, you know, I appreciate the, um, the use of a frame uh, that someone mentioned earlier which obviously we do consider for but if if patients don't need to walk with the frame they don't particularly want to start walking with a frame just to be able to carry their oxygen around Sharon if you can get any pictures that would be fantastic mm -hmm. I've, I've sent a note agrees. over now literally yeah. just sent a note over to say we need to start looking into this and and finding alternatives and, and answers to those questions so the people who are responsible for those should start looking at today. Thank you. Well, I think yesterday. Is there another we hand did... up? 
Well, Niall, I was going to say, yesterday when we did our rehearsal, we expected a few questions, nowhere near as many as we've had. So we've had a good 20 minute of questions and answers now. Um, and I just wonder if now's the time to move on to our next I mean, they, presentation. They haven't broken me yet. If we want to move on, that's fine. <laughs> um, Joe, do you want to take over now? Certainly. Let's continue on to the next set of slides. So do we have Anita available at this time, Claire? No, what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to Claire, who is going to share her presentation and then uh, to Paul and Kieran from the Essex Fire Service. Claire, okay. are you OK to do this? Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, Kieran's going to go first with his fatal fire report, so I'm going to hand over to him and then I'll come back. And Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. OK, thanks, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. So my name's uh, Kieran Moyer. I look after uh, what's called the Live Safe function for um, Essex County Fire and Rescue Service. And there's three of us from fire here today. So there's me uh, first up, and I'm going to talk to you about, um, well, we're going to look at the last 14 fatal fires that have occurred in Essex and just give you a bit of an overview of some of the data that sits behind that, what trends um, and conclusions we're drawing from that. Um, I put Claire will then follow me. She'll talk a little bit about cost of living and the safe and well offer and portable missing systems. And then Paul will sort of pull it all together with our approach to partnership working and uh, how kind of uh, fire and health are moving closer together in the kind of modern period. So um, I'm going to try and share my screen, uh, which hopefully will, will work. Let me give it a second. And Get you guys back on the screen. There we are. That's All right, what here. Paul, yeah, I can see that. Oh, that's the end of the presentation, though. So let's start from the start. Albeit, probably could have just done the last slide and it would have been fine. There we are. Okay, cool. All good. You can see that. Cool. All right. Okay, so. A um, bit of background here. So every time, as you'd expect, every time that somebody dies in a fatal fire anywhere in, in the country, there'll be some kind of um, in-depth kind of uh, report into the circumstances of that fatal. So look at a couple of things. One is the, the the kind of technical reason for the for the fire starting. So we call this the fire investigation. And that looks at causation, so it identifies what was it, what um, caught fire in the first place, uh, to the best of our knowledge, um, which led to the fire starting. But it also looks a little bit at the individual, so the person, their circumstances, and how the how you know they came to be in a situation that enabled a fire to take place and 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 uh, caused them to die uh, as a consequence. So, and then what we do is we take those those um, fatals and we just build them into, into reports periodically throughout the year so that we can just identify any trends or things that might be changing or uh, emerging risks and things like that. And then we try and talk to as many people as possible about those things for more and more. Because Kieran, we're actually you're actually breaking up. We can't hear you very well. Often the Kieran, can you hear us? Because we can't okay. actually can hear you. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you you're break um you're breaking up. Let me. Yeah, okay. Let me have a quick. Worst case scenario, I will relocate. OK, we can hear you now. OK, so I'll leave my camera off for the minute. But does that sound a bit better? Less yeah, robotic. Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> Less robotic. Excellent. I've been described as worse. <laughs> but thank you. Um, OK. 
So let's look first of all at locations then. And if I do break up, if it gets to the point where it's a real problem, let me know and we'll jump to somebody else while I uh, relocate. Okay, so this is, if you don't know Essex, this is Essex, big county. Um, fires in so you can see a little bit of a sweep down the coast there uh that's that's there's a number of things that might sit behind that uh, some of this links into what claire will be talking about a little bit later on and perhaps what other people are seeing in terms of their uh, experience of where the public are at at the moment and kind of the socio-economic uh, situation most of the more deprived areas in essex kind of cluster along the coast so those are our highest areas of deprivation. And we also see those as our kind of centres of um, fire and also fatal fire. But we also had a few sort of rural up in the north of Essex. And then this year we've had three so far, which is which is good, actually. And it's bad that there's three fatals, but it's good in terms of we'd usually expect to see more by this time of the year. Um, so hopefully that stays a low number. But again, those are clustered along the coast. And that will look different depending on where kind of socio-economic deprivation clusters are in your counties or in the, the region. Uh, but for Essex, it tends to be uh, along the coastline. In terms of causes, so um, one of the this diagram on the sort of the, up the top, top left of the screen, uh, shows you causes by fire investigation. So not lighting, uh, candles, smoking, um, cooking, indoor fire. You know, generally, we, we, firefighters uh, who are investigating fires find it difficult sometimes to attribute cause, but all the kind of core uh, key suspects are up there, I guess you could say. Um, smoking making a bit of a comeback, actually. Uh, we saw a few years when that dipped down in terms of causation, but uh, returning to top spot. And then just to give you a sense, there's a whole range of other things that are identified as, as part of a uh, investigation. There are all kinds of kind of health challenges, things affecting mental health, um, but mobility up there is one of the kind of key factors that we pick up uh, as having impacted the uh, the individual survivability in terms of fire. In terms of gender, at the start of the year, we uh, thought that well, there have been lots more females uh, dying in fatal fires than males. There are still more uh, in the in the kind of current part of the data, but um, broadly we see these these even out uh, generally by the end of the year. So we don't see a, a huge difference between uh, gender in terms of people dying in fire. What we do see is the majority live alone. So 10 of the 14 that we're looking at here uh, lived on their own and that would that will look the same across the country and in the national data. Living alone, social isolation is, a, is an indicator of vulnerability across a range, as you'll probably know, across a range of factors, but it is particularly in relation to fatal fire and fire generally. Um, so living alone and that kind of absence of a support system does kind of uh, really contribute to likelihood of ignition or likelihood of having a fire. Interestingly, if you look at that just for, for fire, so not fatal fire, but for fire generally, which we're not looking at here, but if you do, um, you see a spike in terms of living alone, so people who aren't living with anybody else at all. And you also see a spike in terms of people sharing property with, with, the, with groups that are not kind of family or um, relations. So you see a kind of, it's like, the two far ends of the living spectrum uh, increase risk. So having nobody to look after you and having so many people in a property that it kind of diffuses the responsibility for uh, for risk, I suppose. They think kind of student living uh, or HMO. So living, living context matters. In terms of age, pretty much all over the age of 55. Um, and generally in the in the kind of older end end of the age range, so 68 to 85, and that's the same. That the national data kind of reflects that. There will be a few things that buck that data. So if you look back over the last six seven years of data, you'll see Grenfell massively skew uh, the fatalities data, but generally it's older people. 
And interestingly, actually something that surprised us a little bit uh, over the last uh, year and a half, year and a, whatever it is now, um, anecdotally, we kind of expect, if you, if you think about the kinds of health challenges, living challenges, some of the uh, socioeconomic stuff that kind of swells around fatal fires when, when we discuss them and talk about them with partners, we expect there to be a higher kind of proportion of these in social housing or rented accommodation. But actually, generally, the, you know, the majority of people die in fires in Essex, certainly, and in, indeed the region, uh, uh, are in privately owned property. So um, places where there is less in terms of oversight from, any, from anyone else, there's no landlord kind of looking at safety if the landlord is looking at safety. Uh, it's not kind of sheltered accommodation with other people coming in. Um, often these individuals own their own properties, were living alone in them uh, and were aging and dealing with the kind of pressures uh, of aging and, and, and their health situations um, in, the, in the property that they owned and had for some time. And only three of the people who died were receiving formal care, so it was formal care packages around them. And again, this is something that anecdotally we would probably not have expected. We thought that lots of the people, because of the kinds of challenges they were dealing with in terms of their health and well-being, would have some kind of care package in place, and that wasn't the case. Uh, and actually, historically, fire and rescue services have tried really hard to engage with carers and sort of seeing them as the way into preventing fatal fires. And it may be that that's an effective strategy. We think probably is in terms of preventing fire generally, uh, but for fatals that we, we might need to think about that a little more deeply. At five of the 14 were hoarders. Hoarding remains a key risk to a fire generally for a couple of reasons. One is it um, uh, creates what we call fire loading so that the more stuff in a property, the more stuff there is to burn, the fiercer the fire, the quicker it moves, that kind of a, of a concept. Uh, it also obviously obstructs escape and creates a really challenging kind of um, escape situation. Uh, and perhaps uh, this is certainly for Essex, but if we know there's a hoarding at a property because a partner has informed us and partners can let us know that, that's, you know, we're uh, interested in that kind of information. We'll record that on our mobilising system and automatically send a third fire appliance. So you get a uh, um, numerically greater response if we have intelligence to suggest that there's hoarding at a property. And that's just because of the, the speed with which fire can take hold of those conditions and, and the challenges uh, involved in tackling them. Uh, cases, so it'll get a, a fast response in terms of uh, having someone make contact with the resident if they're open to it. Uh, and try and yeah, look at ways we can reduce the risk. We're experiencing challenges with mental health and well-being. And that's everything from uh, depression, anxiety, to uh, a few patients with schizophrenia. Bipolar. 71% of the fatalities were experiencing some kind of challenge to their physical health and well-being, and another 71, 71 is the number here for some reason, but experiencing challenges with their home environment. And by challenge with their home environment, we mean things like, um, I mean, we had a one one property where uh, the individual had been through a significant mental health episode and had essentially vandalised the property and damaged the electrical infrastructure. Uh, another property, a tree had fallen through it and never, never been dealt with. So there's, there's a whole range of reasons that a property might be, the, the challenge experience with it may increase the likelihood of ignition. The key thing here really is that 71% of those individuals who died were uh, living with impacts in more than one of those key risk areas. So those three areas are what we call key risk areas, mental health and wellbeing, physical health and wellbeing, and home environment. The majority of those people that Died. This is the same for serious fires and will be the same across the region. Um, were, were living complex lives, right? They were they were experiencing challenging their mental health and well-being and their physical health and well-being, or the home environment and the mental health and well-being. Uh, so complicated living situations. And what we try and do with, with that information is we look at that and say, OK, if we do we think this person was living at the time of death? And this is really subjective. It's not it's not it's not. <laughs> particularly scientific, but 
based on our kind of experience as an organisation, do we think they were living with a lower than normal and reasonable likelihood of escape or and or with a higher than normal and reasonable likelihood of ignition? And we then try and sort of judge that based on the on the information that we that we have after the fatal. And the reality is that 11 of the 14 were living with both a higher likelihood of ignition and a lower likelihood of escape. And that's the kind of key for fatal fire. That's the key thing to understand. If you've just got a, a lower likelihood of escape but a, and a really high likelihood of ignition in all like, uh, sorry, a high likelihood of escape and a um, high likelihood of ignition, in all likelihood you'll you'll get out in the event of a fire, smoke alarms go off, you'll be able to vacate the property most of the time. It's when the two things hit at the same time that somebody has a really high likelihood of ignition and a really low likelihood of escape that actually that becomes either a really serious fire in which rescue is is required or uh, it, it's a, um, a fatal fire or a serious injury fire. So the number of fires in wards, so we split the county into wards, uh, the electoral wards, and then we look at the rate of fire for each ward. So how many fires has that had over the last seven years? And then we split the county up into clusters, risk clusters, based on likelihood to have a fire in that in that geographical area. And we found that so um, cluster one is our most uh, risky clusters. And about there's about seven wards in Essex that account for 10 percent of all incidents. So seven wards. Um, so they are highest risk clusters. Uh, it's the highest risk cluster. Cluster two, next one down. Cluster three, next one down. Cluster four, lowest risk. The, the thing about fatal fires is none of them occurred in our highest risk clusters. So based on where we know that that you're most likely to have a fire, no fatal fires have occurred in those clusters and still haven't. Uh, only three in cluster two. Uh, the rest were in cluster three or cluster four. So, you know, it, it suggests that there's something different. It's much we can we could load all of our resources into that into our highest risk areas and concentrate on those all year, but we wouldn't have, have managed to avoid any fatal fires uh, over the last year and a half. So, um, the profile for kind of people likely to die in a fatal fire is slightly different to the profile of people who like to have a fire generally and, and, and escape in one. And if we want to try and find those people it's not about necessarily you know knocking on doors geographical concentrations surround the town type events it's much more targeted work with partners three of the incidents occurred in rural wards 11 of the incidents in wards classified as urban we talked to the public and our staff about why that might be there's something interesting about the ability for somebody to disappear in in, in a large kind of urban population the more people perhaps the less people are aware of what's happening on the street who's next door that kind of stuff whether or not uh x person has been out that day or out that week whereas in much more rural areas there's a much kind of tighter sense of uh or people notice more i guess because there's less people and therefore it's easier to do so so the majority of our fatals occurring in uh in urban areas there is also as well as to say, you know, that there's you can read into that, but these are small numbers. But if you lift that up across the, the country, it looks roughly the same. Um, obviously, that is just where there are more people as well. So uh, difficult to say. But the key point here is, you know, people like the quote for Audrey Lord. There's no such thing as single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. And that's why we're that's really the message we're trying to get across. When we're talking about fire fatalities. It's that you know, these um, almost without exception, people are dying in fires where they are living complex lives in relation to their health and, and well-being. And that's why we have a, a model that looks something like this. So we think there are three core risk areas, mental health and well-being, home environment, physical health and well-being. And we think what happens when people experience challenge in more than one area is one of two things. It either increases likelihood of ignition or it decreases likelihood of escape. So a challenge with somebody's mental health and well-being that leads to reliance on uh, alcohol uh, and sees them as, as happened actually uh, last year, sees them, you know, falling asleep 
every night on the sofa drunk um and smoking and things like that leads to an increase in likelihood of ignition or a, a, a real sudden change in mobility leads to a uh, increased or a decrease very likely to escape and the key thing is when these two things happen together that's where there's a, a risk of fatal fire there's also a little bit of evidence coming through we think uh, now that we're looking at this more deeply uh, in terms of the effects of kind of ex i suppose exacerbating factors major events so um about seven of the of the incidents uh, that we've covered in this uh this kind of timeline this presentation um the individuals had experienced something pretty major in terms of their life that had significantly impacted the way they lived with their mental health so uh two of the two of the uh individuals who died last year were um living with kind of they 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 had learning a disability and they'd lived with their uh parents for all of their life and their adult life they'd reached about sort of their 50s to 60s and the parent had died the previous year and left them for the first time ever living alone it led to a, a sudden sort of decrease in um kind of mental health and, and challenge trying to you know figure out how do we navigate the world uh, without that kind of solid support structure that's always been in place uh so that those two are almost identical both male both about the same age both living in the same kind of context both lost uh final kind of parent carer uh, the year before grief generally is a is a recurring factor in terms of what it does to you know couples who live together for for years and years and years and years and, and are aging uh, but also um leaving hospital uh, after a serious incident or fall is another one that has a massive impact on as you probably know on people's kind of mental health and vulnerability at home and sometimes that will do the same thing but a, a quite a nice example i guess not a nice example but an example uh this year of, a, of an elderly lady who had always had a really high likelihood of ignition she was a, a smoke like a trooper um drunk an awful lot I didn't lead, lead the healthiest lifestyle then it was discharged from hospital with a mobility challenge she was unable to kind of move around uh unaided and so all of a sudden had a had a low likelihood of escape now previous near misses always managed to get out this on this occasion uh, temporarily a low likelihood of escape high likelihood of ignition didn't escape so we try and use the the model on the screen to just look at how do where's where are the opportunities to do something about that and kind of get involved and uh, stop the kind of I suppose um, causes realizing and becoming and becoming kind of the the the, the ignition um, and we do that by talking to the frontline health partners we talk to uh, carers we try and do safe and well visits Claire will talk about but most of all, we just try and lift people's awareness of some of the things to, that, that we want to be looking out for when we're talking to members of the public. And those are likelihood of ignition. What is there that could increase the likelihood of a fire starting? And what can we do about that? And likelihood of escape. How do we try and increase that as far as possible? And it goes without saying, and I wouldn't be earning my money if I wasn't saying, you know, the, the, the single best thing we can do sometimes with likelihood of escape is smoke alarms, smoke alarms, smoke alarms. So, just in summary uh then um people will live alone even in private property, major life and various physical health and well-being mental health and well-being and the home environment and that kind of complex lives leading to increased vulnerability and we think in, in all of this partnership working is absolutely key. So it's worth just saying, I, I tell you what, I'll stop sharing my screen a second. Uh, it's worth saying, I think, as well, you know, I, I always think when to live this, it's such a depressing subject. And obviously it can't, I can't, I can't make this any more cheery, I'm afraid. It just kind of is what it is. But, you know, this for Essex, this is 14 people in a population of 1.6 uh, million. And there's many, 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 many more fires than there are fatal fires. And many, many, many more near misses than there are fatal fires. So the work that we do with health and policing at the moment um, in order to identify this risk and then go and do something about it before it becomes a fatal fire, although we really struggle to evidence that, it's really difficult to prove an intervention like that has, has avoided 
a fate becoming a fatality. We know that there are people out there we're seeing every day uh, where we're helping to reduce the risk. So the more eyes and ears got on the ground and the more awareness of this kind of thing we've got, the more we can try and you know ultimately avoid more of this stuff in the future. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that was uh, interesting. A bit of a whistle stop tour for fatal fires. And I guess we've got Claire and Paul next, but I suppose if there's any questions, just pop them in the chat. I don't know, um, Joe, whether you want to take them at the end of this bit or if you want to take them now, if there are any. Yeah, I think Kieran, it's a good idea. Put them in the chat and then people can ask also questions at the end when Claire and Paul have presented. Claire, who's next? Is it yourself? Yeah, okay. it'll be me. Okay. Next. And take control. Uh, lovely, thank you. Um, can guys just let me know that you can see my screen? Hopefully it will load. So can everybody see that? Um, it's got reload to display presentations, what I've got. I can see it. I, don't know. I can see it. You can see it. There, can you see it? No, but if everyone else can, that's fine. And also, Claire, can you just um, speak up a teeny bit? Yeah, of course. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. OK. Lovely. OK, morning, everybody. My name is Claire. I am just carrying on from Kieran's presentation. I am the Safe and Well Lead for Essex County Fire and Rescue Service, and I manage a team of Safe and Well officers who work across Essex visiting those more vulnerable members of the community, offering ways to live more safely whilst remaining as independent as possible in their own homes. Today, I will be sharing information about our Safe and Well Service, the impact that the rise in the cost of living will have on our community and our new portable misting units. Claire, sorry, there are just yeah, some course. other people who can't see can't. it. OK, let me try again. I'll stop sharing and I'll... Thank you. I'll retry. OK, is that any better for anybody? It's not for me, but people, can you put in the chat if you can't see it? Yep, I think uh, there's a couple that can't. Joe, have you any ideas why half can and half can't? Are you currently doing this through web based teams by any chance, Claire? Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> right. In, instead, then, what we'll do, um, can you very quickly email a copy of the presentation to my address, uh, which I will pop into chat now? Would you like me to share my screen? I have a copy of that and perhaps my my platform will support Claire and then Claire can just prompt oh, me on the slide change. Uh, yeah, that would work as well. Give that a try. Paul. One moment. Thanks, Paul. Our hamsters don't run very fast in the fire service. Here we go. It's up and loading. OK, can everybody see that? Yeah, oh, anyone not um, see it? Oh. OK, because we have some that say no. Um, if you can send it to the following. Of course. Um, I will present it from my end and hopefully everyone can see it then. Um, just for clarity, um, did anyone, who, has anyone who currently can't see Claire and Paul's presentation not be able to see any of the slides that I've shared earlier? Just uh, for troubleshooting. No, I think everyone could see before. Yeah, OK, so if I if I that means if I screen it from my end and I'll just move the slides on as appropriate, Claire. Um, That's fine, yeah. Then, yeah, Paul, it would probably be a good idea if you sent yours over as well, just as a precaution. OK, bear with uh, me one moment. I'll just wait for the uh, thing to arrive in my NHS.net email and then I will load up immediately and we'll get underway.
Okay, have you got that, Joe? Just waiting for it to arrive in my inbox. Okay. So thank you for your patience, by the way, everyone. Just while we get these technical issues sorted out, uh, we'll have them eyed out for the future as well. Uh, just wait for that to arrive and I will get shared. Let me know when you're ready. Just waiting for it to come in. While we're waiting, did anyone have any questions for Kieran? Although I, I would just say, although um, Kieran, you say it's it's depressing, it's really important for us to to have that presentation to know um, our local areas and fire risk profiles etc cetera, etc cetera. so um i don't think there is any way to jazz it up or make it a happy topic but just so yeah we're really grateful to hear about it no problem were there any questions i couldn't see no i think I believe there's moved. some was further there? up yeah i, I think okay. I some, yeah oh they're true oh got get scroll through all the no can't see it's <laughs> uh we have one here from uh, Kelly Turner. Um, it says, if we have non-oxygen user patients who are hoarders, should we be considering asking them if we can refer them to FRS? Yeah, abso absolutely. So, um, all, what, I mean, any fire and rescue service will be in, will run some kind of safe and well home safety visit uh, sort of service and would be interested in knowing that even if it's just usually what will happen is they'll, they'll ask if a member of the fire service can go around and have a conversation with them um and just talk them through the risk make sure they've got smoke detection in place make sure it's in the right places sometimes we'll put more smoke detection in a, in a hoarder's property just so that we can make sure that all the rooms are covered where there's uh, uh an increased risk because sometimes what happens is you know the weight of Ordered items for pressure on wiring infrastructure and things like that. So the service will be roughly the same. It's a conversation, it's a home fire safety check or a visit to the individual. But yeah, certainly if you're coming across that kind of thing, really interested in if you can if you can ask them whether they'd be open to a conversation with us, then uh, fire and rescue service would be more than happy to come around and have that. I'd also just say that on the portal um, some time ago. I'd put on a hoarding scale so you can actually grade how um, severe the hoarding is. So you can use that language to pass on to the fire service um, as um, well. Claire and Paul, I've still not yet received it, so I'm not sure if it's something with NHS.net mail. Can you send it to this other address I will put in the chat? OK, let's have a look for any other questions. I, I have them here, actually. Uh, we have one from Sharon Cooper. Is there an increased risk the cost of living crisis will lead to more fatal fires? Uh, yeah, the, well, so Claire's going to talk a little bit about about this and um, answered probably yes. So some of the things that we see, um, I, I guess, oh, well, I guess the way into this is to look at the, what is the link between the causes of fire generally and fatal fire specifically and the, the sorts of impacts that the cost of living crisis is likely to have. And I think what we are going to see, as I say, Claire will come on to this, is some kind of increase in maybe an alternative heating and that kind of thing, fuels, but also impacts in terms of mental health um, and sort of the stress that's built around uh, around a lack of money or lack of financial means. So we talk about tunnelling, so focusing on, on uh, the thing that's kind of most important to you at that time, whether that's putting food on the table or paying the energy bills or whatever, and therefore the exclusion of other things. People start to forget about some of the things that might, you know, be advisable in terms of their own personal safety. Um, to the point where just people, the more tired you are, the more stressed you are, the less you may be thinking about have I extinguished the candles, have I switched the cooker, you know, all the things that you kind of run through your head, that kind of mental checklist. Of things you do to kind of stay safe you start some of those things drop off because of the lack of bandwidth as you're focusing on other priorities so yeah we think we think there will be an increase and there was after covid an increase in, in fatal fires as people started to kind of close doors and shut themselves off from communities so uh 
prediction for probably yes. Um, sadly. Thanks, Zach, Kieran. Um, just very quickly, Claire, Paul, you've sent the, um, I've been sent the, um, the SharePoint links uh, for that. If I can't access those, I need an actual uh, copy of the presentation as an attachment. Um, if you can save a copy to your uh, PC and then attach it to the email there, uh, send it to the at boc.com email and I'll pick it up there pretty sharp. It came through a lot quicker on that one than uh, NHS.net. Uh, we had a comment as well from Denise Mountain, uh, which read as Kieran, uh, it may be a depressing subject, but your presentation really highlights how important it is for us as health professionals to ensure we assess and get support as needed. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I, it's, it is one of those things. What we're trying to do is we're trying to talk to as many, so a bit of a plug, I guess, but it, one of the things we want to really do is talk to people who are working sort of frontline um, voluntary or, or paid roles with vulnerable people. Um, because we've got we've got a range of kind of sort of topic presentations that we can deliver. So one is around um fat what we know about fatal fires and sort of fire fat fire fatality generally looking at that data just a little bit more in depth we've got some case studies in there uh and that's deliverable to anybody with an interest and we can do that sort of strategic or or um people on the ground uh but also there's a what we call um fire and safety in the home module where it's really designed to identify the kind of leading risks of fire in the home and then enable us to talk to people who are working in other people's homes to help them kind of spot those things and figure out what they can do, what mitigations are there uh, when they come across those those risks. Um, and it takes about an hour and we're really keen to talk to kind of anybody who's interested uh, about things like that, particularly if you're in Essex, but we're not, you know, uh, we'll talk to other farm rescue services if, if, uh, if you're over the border. Um, but really just trying to kind of raise awareness of some of the of some of the uh, key risks you're going to come across in people's properties um, and what we might be able to do to to prevent those. And it's usually Paul or another officer that will come and deliver that um, as well. So that's something perhaps people on the call might be interested in. Kieran, sorry, can I just ask Claire yeah. from BOC here, the model that you have it can oh, so our clinicians are based uh, whole of east of england whole of east midlands can they expect to find your equivalent in say east midlands or or does each uh, fire service operate slightly differently with their the, with their build is there a, a claire and a kieran and a paul in say um lincolnshire uh they're they're, they're say the Fire and rescue services, the way fire and rescue services is structured is that there's, it, every county has an independent its own kind of fire and rescue service and they come under different governance structures. So some are governed by police, fire and crime commissioners, others are governed by through county council uh, set up, so the local authority. So they're all, they are all separate kind of structures and because of that they all have slightly different um, you know, personnel structures and ways of dealing with this stuff. But there is some real, there's some commonality between it. So you, just for some context, you may or may not know. Um, prior to, I think maybe 2018, 2019, maybe a bit earlier than that anyway, but it wasn't long ago, with, certainly within within the last seven, six, seven years. Um, Fire and Rescue Services didn't have an inspectorate. So you've got obviously Ofsted for schools and um, uh, Majesty Inspector for the Constabulary for Police, but there was no inspectorate for uh, fire and rescue services there was, there was there was no kind of unified way in which to to measure the way that fire and rescue services are performing and then they introduced um hmic frs so majesty's inspector of fire and rescue services and it's the same as the police one and they come in and they do 30-day inspections and what that's led which is great fun uh, actually and what that's led to is a real standardizing of kind of the of the language and approach across fire and rescue services so we're starting to see much more similarity which is really helpful so there's a couple of things they're interested in. One is home fire safety checks. So every fire and rescue service should have some kind of approach to a home fire safety check. So that's that, that ability for you as uh, or professionals or whoever to refer into a fire and rescue service for advice and guidance in relation to home safety. So that should exist all over the country as a mechanism. And there will be someone, some kind of player in charge of, of that kind of operation and able to receive referrals and do something with them. So uh, yes, that exists. Fire and services do work slightly differently in terms of the kind of thinking behind it. So they won't all have a 
have a model, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but they'll all have a, they'll all have data and they'll all have access to that and, and an ability to talk to you about their their own kind of approach to preventing uh, fire in their part of the world. But certainly they'll all have the infrastructure to complete visits. And well, I think it's really interesting to think you've got an equivalent of the CQC for the fire service. Um, Kieran, thank you very much for that. Now, whilst we're tr still trying to sort out Paul and Claire's presentation, Anita has joined us, um, so we will we can flip uh, the presentations around for Anita to present now, if that's all right, Claire and Paul, whilst we troubleshoot and get yours up. OK, that's brilliant. Um, Anita, would you like to just say hello? Hi, um, my name's um, Anita. Um, I'm Anita, Anita Sagal, one of the respiratory registrars working at the Royal Free Hospital. I'm currently um, studying towards a uh, master's in research and looking at the role of um, nasal high flow in um, for domiciliary use in COPD patients. I'm just having a few technical issues myself. Um, <laughs> everything was running very smoothly this morning. Um, so if you can just like, give me two minutes to um, well, try Anita, not The other slides. option is we could um, share for you and move through the slides because I've, we've downloaded it as well. So do you want us to share? No, I think it will be fine. If you just give okay. me, I'll just put myself, my camera off and my mic off for two minutes and I'll hopefully be able to sort it, OK? OK, that's fine. A little bit of gremlins this morning with our IT side, isn't that? So hopefully Anita will be able to pull up her slide pack and share her screen and then uh, take control and we'll move through her presentation and then we'll finish off with the fire service. Um, the hoarding scale is on the portal in library. So I'm just asking, answering a question that's on the chat there. Um, there's a lot more I'd like to do with the library that's on the portal, but I do try and put some useful information in there that's national. OK, Anita, I'm going to put my mic off and it's over to you. We can see the, yeah, we can see your slide there. OK, can everyone actually see those slides? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Can yes. you all see the slides? Hello, can you see the slides? Yes. Oh, OK, brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, um, I don't know if it's a feedback issue, but I couldn't hear anybody. OK, brilliant. Please stop me if you can't hear me um, clearly through the talk at any point. Um, hopefully it will run smoothly. So as I said, um, I'm a clinical research fellow uh, working in sleep and ventilation in respiratory medicine at the moment, and I'm starting towards a master's in research. And I'm actually conducting a trial looking at the use of um, domiciliary nasal high flow in in COPD at the moment. Thank you for inviting me to talk to everyone today. Um, I found some of the talks really interesting and definitely has changed my uh, educational content on you know, fire safety risks and uh, oxygen prescribing for sure. I've just moved on to the next slide. Can I just check that that's worked for everybody? Yes, that's yeah. working. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so I think to first understand how nasal high flow works, I think we have to understand essentially how we breathe and go back to basics. And apologies if this is oversimplified for anyone, but I think with uh, as I get older, I struggle to re remember the basics. So I think it's good to always recap. And I think the main uh, concept to understand um, is that firstly of tidal volume. Essentially, this measures the amount of air that is um, breathed in and out through a normal breath. Uh, and on average, this volume is about one and a half litres. And you can see that volume depicted in yellow um, in the in this uh, picture to the right. There's always an additional amount, however, that you can exhale or inhale even after you take a normal breath. And those are depicted in blue and red. So in blue is the expiratory reserve volume. And conversely, in red is the inspiratory reserve volume, which is the additional amount of air that can be inhaled after a normal breath in. So next bit's quite important. What you're left with is the residual volume, which is the amount of air that is left after an expiratory reserve volume has been breathed out. And that's really important because lungs essentially never completely empty. 
there's always some air left in the lungs after you maximally breathe out. And if that residual volume didn't exist and the lungs emptied completely, the lung tissues would stick together and the energy necessary to reinflate the lung would essentially be too great to overcome. So in normal healthy lungs, hopefully like we all have uh, on this talk, say so fingers crossed, during relaxed tidal breathing, the lungs will return to a basal level of inflation. And that's termed the functional residual capacity, which you can see in a nice kind of, I suppose, panky, sammy, knee brown colour on the diagram. During exercise, um, you have to increase the tidal volume and also your respiratory rate to match um, the increased ventil ventilatory requirements of the lungs. So to meet that improved gas exchange that's needed because the respir respiratory muscles need sufficient oxygen to work properly. But to maintain stable lung volumes as you exercise, the expiratory muscles have to be recruited. And what they do is they elevate the pressure at the level of the alveolus in the lung and the pleura, which is the lining of the lung. And they maintain a transpulmonary pressure between the two. And that increases and forces out expiratory flow. And that forces that increased tidal volume that you've been working hard to generate to be completely breathed out before the next breath. And that's quite an important concept to understand in how we breathe normally and how we compensate for changes when we exercise. I think the next important step to understand is that of lung compliance. So lung compliance reflects the ability of the lungs to expand in response to any changes in volume and pressure. So that compliance is representing the change in any lung volume for each change in the transpulmonary pressure the pressure between the alveolus and the pleural pressure at any given time. And it's probably greatest when it's working at a moderate lung volume. To try and explain that a bit further, I compare it to a balloon and that's how I've sort of understood it best myself. So a balloon's easiest to inflate when it's been blown up a little, but it's hardest right at the beginning or hardest right at the end. So basically in healthy subjects, when you breathe out, your elastic recoil is decreasing all the time and it will reach zero. So and when it's zero is when you're, it's easiest for you to blow out that balloon, for example. And that point and that equilibrium point occurs at functional residual capacity. So that's when your lungs are working in their optimum, I suppose, is how to describe it. And when the lungs are essentially in the equilibrium. So unfortunately, anything that increases lung compliance will result in the lungs being able to inflate with air quite easily because there's been a loss of elastic recoil of the lungs. And on the other hand, decreased lung compliance implies that the lungs are getting stiffer and a greater change in pressure is needed for a given change in volume. You can see that nicely illustrated on the graph, the graph to the right, the top graph, where in patients with emphysema, where you've got that loss of elastic recoil, you've got a steeper incline. And in fibrotic patients, um, where you have decreased lung compliance, there's a bigger pressure needed to generate um, the given change in volume. So where there is decreased compliance, lots of causes can result in that. Um, collapse of the lungs, fluid in the lungs, fibrosis, so excess fibrotic tissue in the lungs, pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs, or absence of surfactant, which is the lining between the pleura, the two pleuras of the lungs. And what happens basically is if you get damage to the connective tissues, um, that lung elastic recoil decreases. And so that equilibrium point where functional residual capacity is will develop at a higher lung volume, which is bad because essentially what it means is that there's increased air remaining in the lungs after you breathe out. That term is referred to as static hyperinflation, and you may well have heard that. So it's really important to remember that compliance is reduced at low and very high lung volumes. And I'm going to talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease now, but I just want to reiterate the point that in COPD, what happens when patients are recruiting their expiratory muscles, they're increasing their expiratory flow, they're generating more positive pleural pressure, and they're causing the airways to typically collapse. And as a result, a full breath doesn't occur and further air trapping occurs. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, essentially is an inflammatory, chronic inflammatory condition that results in airway narrowing from a variety of reasons, environmental exposure ranging from tobacco smoke, indoor air pollution and occupational dust, um, combined with genetic risk factors and individual risk factors in addition. It unfortunately causes progressive respiratory symptoms, 
breathlessness, cough and sputum. And actually, it's the third leading cause of death worldwide, um, resulting in 3.23 million deaths in 2019. This figure shows the effects of this process that I've been trying to describe, which is called dynamic hyperinflation on lung volumes. So in COPD, if you've got small airways that are narrowed or obstructed from that chronic inflammatory condition, there's obviously airflow limitation when you breathe out. And what happens is that the inhaled volume of air is greater than the volume that you breathe out and air is trapped within the lung, which I've said. You can see during resting breathing in COPD, which is depicted by the green line, and in healthy individuals, which is depicted by the blue line, a breath is inhaled to tidal volume and an equal volume is exhaled. So the FRC remains stable, but it's still overall increased in patients with COPD. But what happens um, as you exercise or anything that increases your breathing rate or your tidal volume, for example, if you're agitated or you're anxious, um, the inspiratory volume becomes greater than the expiratory volume. And so the volume in the lungs increases with each breath, and that leads to a progressive increase in your functional residual capacity, but more importantly, a reduction in your ability to have an inspiration, inspire, so a reduction in your inspiratory capacity. And that's what causes people to come breathless and limits people in terms of their physical activity in COPD. Um, why have I gone on about this so much? I think it's really important that to understand that hyperinflation is really clinically relevant. It contributes to the breathlessness and the morbidity associated with COPD, and it's related to reduced um, daily physical activity. And that's a really important um, aspect of quality of life in these patients. And I think this is the last slide on you know the scientific reasons behind um, how COPD develops, but. I wanted to sort of illustrate that it's a balance between the load imposed on the respiratory um, system and the capacity of which it can absorb, i.e. the muscles and how much it can tolerate. So the load can be in different forms, uh, resistive from airway inflammation, bronchospasm and phlegm reduction, or elastic from hyperinflation as we described. And ultimately it all generates a raised intrinsic positive ends, ends in spiritual pressure that the body needs to breathe again, breathe out. Um, in order to take a good enough deep breath in. And if the muscles can't um, compensate uh, because hyperinflation actually causes muscle shortening, then an increased ventilatory response happens and that's perceived as breathlessness, which is term neural respiratory derived. So now moving on to nasal high flow. It's interchangeably called high flow therapy, nasal high flow. I like to call it nasal high flow. It's just what I'm used to. Um, people call it high flow nasal cannula as well. But high flow therapy was first painted by uh, transpirator technologies in 1988, so long ago, and was developed actually for both humans and race forces. And then it was commercially produced. What we're probably more familiar with is closed systems like non-invasive ventilation, intubation and ventilation, CPAP therapy, but high flow therapy is not a closed circuit between the device and the patient, and you would expect gas leak from the mouth. It's delivered, it's a non-invasive respiratory therapy um, because it's delivered in the nasal, by a nasal cannula interface, and it can deliver inspired oxygen separately to flow um, itself. And you can independently deliver flow rates up to 60 litres per minute, and we'll come on to why that's beneficial later. At the moment, it's most commonly delivered in the critical care setting, but I would say that its ease of setup actually means that it can be applied on the high dependency units and at home. It can commonly be delivered by the nasal cannula interface, which I've described, but that's different to conventional oxygen um, nasal prongs because it's softer and more pliable. And what's really important about it is that you need to select the size of the nasal prongs that maximises the nasal prongs to nares ratio, as that will impact one of the physiological properties of um, nasal high flow, i.e. the positive pressure that's delivered to the patient. So what are the physiological effects of humidified high flow therapy? Well, you can break them down into three, um, and this was nicely sum summarised in a review article um, written by Rebecca de Cruz et al from the guys and Thomas's team. And essentially three properties that we'll discuss in a bit more detail are mucociliary clearance, so improved functioning of the mucociliary um, that 
cilia that line the airways of the lung and improve transport, which has been demonstrated in bench studies. Um, and then clearance of any dead space ventilation and dead space um, in the lungs is bad. And the reason it is, is that essentially those parts of the lung are not contributing to good gas exchange. And what nasal high flow does, um, which actually was a really hard concept for me to understand when I first sort of understood the properties of nasal high flow, is essentially it's a continuous flow that washes out any of the exhaled carbon dioxide that we're breathing. So if, if you're abnormally breathing and you're um, having a high concentration of carbon dioxide when you breathe out, it washes that out with normal air with a lower concentration of carbon dioxide. And that helps build up an oxygen reservoir and washes out your carbon dioxide and improves your dead space ventilation within your lungs. And ultimately, it leads to improved pulmonary mechanics, so reduced work of breathing, improved lung compliance and improved gas exchange. So I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more in detail. Please stop me if anything's not clear. So one way I think by which nasal high flow works is that it impacts on mucociliary clearance. So the cilia are hair-like projections that line the airways of the lungs, and they also contain goblet cells, which secrete phlegm mucus and that helps protect the lining of the bronchus and traps those microorganisms that we don't want and gets rid of them essentially by clearing them out of the lungs. The diagram on the left was conceptualised by a group in 1996, Williams et al. And what that research group showed is that they showed that optimal mucociliary transport was defined as that which clears contaminants and excess secretions from the respiratory tract and the velocity or the speed at which it did so depend, was dependent on several factors. But what it showed was that all of those factors were optimised under core temperature and 100% relative humidity. So that model shows sort of an equilibrium or optimised point at the peak with any deviation from that peak from inspired humidity and core temperature, um, leading to impaired clearance of the cilia. So much so that on the left of that graph, you can see that mucus becomes thick, it stops working, the cilia stops working, leading to cell damage and atelectasis. The graph on the right, um, which is a bit poor in terms of the actual, how it's been portrayed, um, shows the relationship between humidification, so domiciliary humidification at home and improved mucociliary clearance. And this study was done um, in bronchiectatic patients in I think 2008. Patients were essentially given inhaled high flow air at 37 degrees for three hours a day, and they measured um, the clearance of the radio aerosol before and after the treatment. And I hope you can appreciate the darker line is the post-treatment arm um, at the end of seven days. And you can see the percentage of opacification had improved in that post-treatment arm, and that sort of demonstrates better clearance of that radio aerosol. So it sort of proves that, you know, what we all know, which is domiciliary humidification improves lung mucociliary clearance. The second mechanism is that of continuous flushing of exhaled gases from the upper airways, which I've described. So um, Moller et al demonstrated this in a tube model and they performed their ex experimental models on this tube model and filled it with a trace of gas and then looked at the washout and clearance characteristics caused by the delivery of high flow air at different rates. I'll explain the results in a minute, but I'll just reinforce the point. What nasal high flow does is it continually washes those upper and lower airways. And just with that continuous high flow, the exhaled air in the upper airways is replaced by continuously fresh air with low, lower carbon dioxide levels and leads to less CO2 rebreathing but also replaces the oxygen with a re replacement of excess oxygen in the airways as well, which is a good thing. The experimental models essentially showed, as you can see on the diagram on the left, that clearance rates increased, uh, in clearance rates of that radioactive substance um, was better, within, was, was de decreased essentially with increasing nasal high flow rates. And you can therefore say that the washout of anatomical dead space increases in proportion to an increasing flow rate. The reason that's relevant to patients in COPD is that the dead space in the lungs contributes to impaired exercise tolerance and impaired ventilation. So actually high flow gas has been shown to improve endurance and oxygen saturations during exercise. 
The positive pressure delivered by nasal high flow also is sufficient to counterbalance the threshold load that we described that occurs in COPD. Even though it's a low pressure, typically under three centimetres of um, water with the mouth closed and one centimetre of water with the mouth open, when you're typically delivering at 35 litres per minute, that actually increases by 0.7 centimetres of water for every 10 litres per minute increase in the flow rate. I think more importantly, the positive airway pressure generated by nasal high flow when you breathe out mimics the patient's breathing pattern. Uh, you've probably all heard of the concept of pursed lip breathing, which is an involuntary compensatory mechanism that COPD patients adopt to relieve breathlessness. But by creating a positive pressure environment, the high flow nasal cannula not only mimics that compensatory mechanism, but it also um, presses um, through the cannula from the interior of the nasopharynx outwards. And that dilates the radius of the nasopharyngeal airways, reducing the resistance to airway flow and improving ventilation and oxygenation. And actually nasal high flow has been shown compared to conventional low flow oxygen and a face mask to reduce respiratory rate, lead to stable or increased tidal volumes and improve breathlessness. It's important to think why is the flow rate so important and um, one obvious benefit is that the high flow nasal cannula delivers very high flow rates of gas in an attempt to match the patient's inspiratory flow demands. So patients in acute respiratory failure they actually become very tachypnea, very they have high respiratory rates and their peak inspiratory flows which would normally be between 30 to 60 litres at rest per minute at rest, can reach upwards to 120 litres per minute um, in respiratory failure. And so if they have really high peak respiratory flow rates, they are producing minute volumes of more than 20 litres per minute in some adults. Um, so if they receive a 15 litre per minute non-rebreathe mask, then that doesn't provide adequate support. So it's really important to select a flow rate dependent on the level of hypoxemia and the inspiratory effort and to use a flow rate that matches the patient's inspiratory flow. I think lastly also the flow rate is also important because nasal high flow has built-in oxygen sensors and they analyse the inspired gas and that allows the system to detect discrepancies between the device setting and what's delivered to the patient with an accuracy of between two to four percent. That stability and reliability increases with increasing flow rate and is further increased by mouth breathing. So nasal high flow to summarise consists of an active humidifier, an air oxygen blender and a heated single limb circuit, which can deliver gas up to 60 litres per minute. There's a wealth of evidence that's emerged in the acute setting for the applicability of nasal high flow. And again, the review article I mentioned earlier nicely demonstrates and summarises key effect within each setting. But most importantly, you can see an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, which, which we're probably most familiar with, especially through the COVID pandemic. Um, there is a reduced risk of intubation in patients using nasal high flow that have moderate or severe hypoxemia compared to other modalities such as conventional oxygen therapy. And there are similar rates of intubation that we're comparing it with NIV and face mask oxygen. And for example, when you're having breaks from positive airway pressure, it actually is more comfortable and been proven to be more comfortable than conventional nasal cannula and NIV. And it allows oral intake because it isn't closing off the mouth and neural um, nasal interface it helps that. What we want to know, however, is the role of nasal high flow in a domiciliary setting, given its ability to improve the respiratory system in many ways. So most of the evidence comes from studying patients with COPD, and that's because Increased airways resistance develops from respiratory infections that trigger um, exacerbations of COPD and the mucus production can cause worsening air trapping and that hyperinflation decreases excise tolerance and worsens quality of life. But nasal high flow can actually perhaps counteract that by humidifying the airways, facilitating the clearance of the mucociliary lining, decreasing work of breathing and reducing respiratory rate and decreasing air trapping ultimately. I'm now going to present some of the key studies that present data on nasal high flow, including some of the key randomised control studies and randomised cross crossover studies. They nicely sort of develop across the years to evaluate patients with type 1 respiratory failure in a chronic setting, so acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, to patients with not only hypoxemic respiratory failure, but that are also daytime hypercapnic, so they have raised carbon dioxide levels 
i.e. those patients with type 2 respiratory failure, so more severe patients. Um, I've included a picture of two important review articles um, diagonally opposite each other and two systematic reviews which are quite key um, if you want to do any further reading on the topic. So in 2010, uh, RIA et al, this research group, looked at the clinical utility of long-term humidification uh, therapy in chronic airways disease. They studied a mixed population of patients with COPD and bronchiectasis, and it was a randomised controls trial comparing nasal high flow to usual care across 12 months. And this group actually just used air, didn't use oxygen therapy, um, and they used a flow rate of 20 to 25 litres per minute. And I stress the importance of air alone. And they showed improved outcomes. They showed fewer exacerbation days in the nasal high flow group compared to um, usual care and an increased time to first exacerbation, which you can see nicely in the graph on the right. Their mean use was only 1.6 hours per day in this study. So, you know, it was already emerging that nasal high flow was um, beneficial and even at very low um, usage. And just the flow itself. Moving on to 2008, um, Stoggard et al. looked at nasal high flow in combination with long term oxygen therapy compared to long term oxygen therapy alone. And this was a randomised crossover study of 200 patients who were already established on long term oxygen therapy. So they were already hypoxemic. Um, they didn't actually show any difference in mortality hospital emissions, but what they did notice was a reduction in the exacerbation rate of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And you can see that the slides on the right show an improvement in a reduction of symptoms according to the MMLC score in nasal high flow, which is depicted by red. In the quality of life, which is depicted by the St George's Respiratory Questionnaire in B, again, nasal high flow improves quality of life in these patients. And a reduction in carbon dioxide levels and an improvement in exercise capacity if you look at the six minute walk test in D. So everything improved in the nasal high flow group and the adherence in this study was six hours a day and a flow rate was 20 litres per minute was used. Remember that flow rate is quite low um, considering that um, we know that improved flow rates um, have beneficial properties in terms of improving dead space ventilation essentially. So moving on to more severe patients now, in 2019, Bronnick et al. looked at nasal high flow versus non-invasive ventilation in, in patients with chronic hypercapnic um, COPD. It's quite a you know, groundbreaking study when it was done. And it compared nasal high flow delivering 20 litres per minute again, so quite a low flow, versus non-invasive ventilation over six weeks in a crossover design as well. And they showed a considerable reduction in carbon dioxide levels, more than five millimetres of mercury in 37% of patients using nasal high flow and um, in 52 patients using non-invasive ventilation. There were increases also seen in the PCO2 as depicted by the waterfall plots on the right. And there was increases in CO2 of 26 in 26% of patients with nasal high flow and 22% non-invasive non ventilation. But ultimately, this study showed a non-inferior reduction of carbon dioxide in between both devices. The mean duration of use was 5.2 hours per day. But importantly, in this study, you could argue that uh, perhaps compliance with an IV was not optimal because they were only using it 3.9 hours um, overnight. And the flow rate of the nasal cannula perhaps wasn't optimised. So moving on to the latest study um, that was published recently in 20, 2022 in the Blue Journal. This recruited 104 participants in a randomised crossover study, but nasal high flow was com um, combined with long term oxygen therapy and compared to long term oxygen therapy alone. But this was now in severe hypercapnic COPD. So patients with not that were not only hypoxemic as per the Stoggard trial, but patients that were also daytime hypercapnic and hypoxemic requiring long-term oxygen therapy. So in the graph on the right, in the upper right, you can see that high flow nasal cannula prolonged the duration without a moderate and severe exacerbation, but 
It also significantly reduced the rate of moderate and severe exacerbations, as is shown in the bar graph on the bottom right, which hasn't come out very clearly. So the median time to first moderate or severe exacerbation in the long term oxygen therapy group was 25 weeks, and they didn't actually reach uh, an exacerbation um, in the combined nasal high flow and long term oxygen therapy group. The effects on health related quality of life are modest, um, but they did show a signal towards improved saturations at 52 weeks as well. The last study I'm going to present is a meta analysis. Um, and actually, this meta analysis doesn't just study domiciliary use of um, nasal high flow, it does include it, some acute studies as well. But what I did want to show is that two of the nine studies that were looked at showed that nasal high flow improved the transcutaneous carbon dioxide level overnight um, compared with controls, which is shown on the top right and in the forest plot, sorry. And in the bottom figure five, um, it also, I think three studies showed that there was an improvement in nasal when using nasal high flow compared to controls in six minute walk tests walk distance as well. Interestingly, seven studies didn't show that nasal high flow increased oxygenation compared with controls. So ultimately, we're accumulating a wealth of evidence that shows that nasal high flow is safe in stable chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and that it has a variety of uses and applicability for domiciliary use. Um, I think we still remain unsure what the optimal settings and the flow rate should be, especially as higher flow rates are shown to be effective. Um, certainly my experience from using the device is that between 30 to 45 litres of flow can be quite comfortable. And in some patients, they can tolerate higher flow rates, but it's certainly not um, well tolerated by everybody. So the higher flow rates can be a bit more uncomfortable for some patients. Um, there obviously is a need for adequate washout in crossover studies if we're really truly comparing it to other devices. And, you know, we've got a really difficult population. These research studies had good adherence rates and good um, use of the nasal high flow. But the reality is that in, in clinical practice, as we all know, is that patients don't always adhere to their device and use it in the way intended, um, despite it being beneficial for them, for example. These studies have studied quite a diverse group of COPD, but not an unstable group of COPD. So we have patients in real life that we see that are much frailer and the frail ends of the spectrum are those that are requiring long term oxygen therapy. And we need to know about the applicability in those patients that are more disabled by their breathing and how they can use the equipment. And ultimately, we're still unsure on the effect of airflow rate independent of oxygen delivery. So from a research point of view and a clinical point of view, we need to know um, about the applicability in these groups. Um, we need more evidence that it can be used in hypercapnic respiratory failure and is safe compared to other devices um, or non-inferior, for example. Um, we need to know that it can be used in an exercise capacity to improve um, patients' ability to exercise with COPD as that's really important for maintaining muscle strength um, and reducing the risk of um, dynamic hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And also in more frail advanced populations, um, given that it helps with breathlessness quite significantly in lots of studies, uh, we wonder whether you know it could have a role in, in a frailer patients. I've reached the end of my slides and I think I've just kept the time. So I'm happy to answer any questions that um, have arisen and I'll take my camera off so hopefully you can see me now and also hear me. Are there any questions from anybody? Oh, hello, yes. Um, uh, uh, what, what concerns me is, is at the moment, um, the domiciliary equipment that we have is, is very restrictive on mobility. And, um, and with the stable COPD patients, when we want them to be active, and they already have, um, yeah, we often have problems with compliance anyway, because people don't want to be sitting on their oxygen all day. And, and obviously with normal LTOC, they, they can be more mobile than they could be with high flow oxygen. So um, you said that 
that the benefits persist even just with a, a couple of hours on the high flow oxygen. So even if they couldn't exercise while using the high flow oxygen, do you perceive that there are benefits there anyway? If they've if they've worn it all morning, will they be able to exercise better in the yeah, afternoon, yeah, for exactly. example? So you've got two groups of patients. Um, you've got patients with um, uh, that essentially are quite frail and perhaps would not be able to exercise significantly, but may have an improvement in their activities of daily living. And in that group of patients, I, I certainly see that you could, uh, nasal high flow has a significant role, but nasal high flow has a role significantly beyond that. And it's not just by delivering oxygen. The air flow rate also improves um, uh, gas exchange as we've demonstrated in this talk. And therefore more research needs to understand whether the nasal high flow delivering air alone could be an option for patients. That doesn't get away from the fact that obviously machines are bulky and being attached to a machine um, throughout the day or even you know throughout the day might be burdensome for a patient but actually you know what we need to understand is whether using the nasal high flow for example over the night can be beneficial to patients and improve their daytime gas exchange which certainly I think it can. And in addition, um, you know, the nasal high flow, the new, newer devices are battery operated um, and therefore they will become more portable and more compact, I believe, over time, similar to the portable oxygen um, packs that, we, that we, we, have. we have. So I think so there is an evolving um, the equipment and the technology is evolving. And I think that patients will be able to use this in the future. Um, in 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 any way that's convenient for them so whether it's sitting there for a few hours in the daytime because that certainly still has an imp um, does lead to an improvement clearly to whether they use it overnight and then it improves their energy levels and their focus for the day and and gives them more energy to exercise in the day i hope that's, that's that question. question well thank you i bet it's partly that the, the portable aspect of it is i would have thought was negated by the need for humidification um, the, it's actually, if you take a nasal high flow device, they are actually fairly portable. They're not heavy. Um, they can be moved from room to room. So, and actually they've got quite a long tubing. So actually from a practical aspect, if you're sitting in your kitchen and you're doing things in terms of activity, you could really, you know, use it. It's just whether the patient is too frail to be able to, you know, pick it up and move it across with them but that would be in in that case in that scenario I think long-term oxygen therapy would also be limited in terms of its applicability um, but the beauty of long-term oxygen therapy where it's indicated and nasal high flow is that both of these devices can be also worn during sleep um, and arguably if patients are so frail that they're needing long-term oxygen therapy and NIV at night for example um, there's no reason that they can't be using it and then that might improve their their exercise capacity in the daytime. The humidification itself, I don't think impacts upon, actually people, people, the device, the Airbo device certainly has three settings um, in terms of humidity and temperature. Um, so it has a lower setting, a middle setting and a higher setting. And patients can adjust that temperature setting accordingly. Um, and, and people prefer different options actually I've found. Some patients with COPD seem to prefer the temperature setting at 37, but in the study that I'm doing where I'm looking at patients with obesity hyperventilation syndrome, a lot of the patients prefer cooler settings because they're used to the non-invasive ventilation already. I think we've got a question from Ruth as well. Ruth, do you want to speak? Hi, yeah. Um, obviously, it's been a bit in use in the community in the East Midlands, but there's been some concerns that patients once started on it would then become reliant on it. So, well, they might start off just using it six hours, but then would struggle to come off it or their oxygen requirements might increase. Just wondered if you found any evidence of that at all. So, nasal high flow in the research literature and in my my practical experience really has very little um, problems in terms of the side effects. Um, actually, it's very well tolerated by most patients. I think the only problem that really arises is perhaps if they have a blocked nose, for example, when they have a cold, it can sometimes be a bit difficult with the flow rate going up um, into the nose. But in the majority of patients that are using it, 
um, there certainly isn't actually any disadvantage to using it for longer um, because the flow rate has benefits in itself. Um, long term, if you're delivering oxygen therapy through a nasal high flow device, um, then that's a different matter because if you're delivering long term oxygen therapy, that's got to be within the prescribed um, correct capacity for the patient. And actually what what is not being done correctly is that patients are not being prescribed oxygen in a safe and consistent and reliable manner. So patients really who need oxygen therapy should have really been adequately what we call phenotypes. So they should have had a sleep study assessing whether they um, their oxygen levels go low at night and whether they have any form of sleep disordered breathing. So patients with COPD can nocturnally hyperventilate at night, but they can also have coexistent sleep apnea. And in that case and in that situation, first and foremost, they need to be adequately ventilated if they need ventilatory support. So that's where you would just decide whether you needed um, a form of PAP therapy, either through CPAP or um, non-invasive ventilation, depending on whether they were daytime hypercapnic or not, and whether they had any underlying pattern of sleep disordered breathing. And in th that situation, once the patients have been adequately treated, you would then assess whether those patients needed long term oxygen therapy in addition or not. There is obviously a role for some patients with COPD, for example, needing long term oxygen therapy that don't need ventilation at night. Um, there is a group of those patients in addition. But I think what's historically done badly is that we don't actually assess patients need for oxygen therapy the, the adequately in the first instance. So I don't see any harm in giving oxygen through a nasal high flow device and patients using it if they've de been deemed to be safe and that's been deemed to be the adequate need for the, that patient. I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Anita. And I think would, if this is just the last question we've got time for now. Um, Helen has asked, are there any contraindications to nasal high flow therapy? She's asked about type 2 respiratory failure, but of course there's a washout effect, isn't there, from nasal high flow, but do you just want to answer that? Yeah, so contraindications would be if there's any abnormalities of nose that occlude you from fitting the nasal cannula within the nose. I mean, that, that's really the basic contraindication um, if you've had plastic surgery or there's some, you just can't tolerate it, for example, in the nose. That's not a contraindication, that's just patient not being able to tolerate it in their nose, for example. Um, in terms of hypercapnic respiratory failure, that's why I think research groups across the world are, you know, really trying to build a wealth of data um, evaluating the safety profile in, in patients with chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. Now, you've obviously got nasal high flow that can be used with air alone, or you've got nasal high flow that can be used with long-term oxygen therapy. And we've seen that in the Nagata study in 2022, which was recently published, that there were no adverse consequences in, 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 in that group of patients. With any research study, you have to be able to apply it to your general population that you serve locally. And there are always going to be differences in the group of patients um, that you serve compared to research studies. So you have to be wary of that and mindful of that. And there certainly aren't any guidelines yet that have implemented nasal high flow for the use of chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure in the UK. But that's why we're trying to accumulate evidence to generate more data about the profile of how it works and in a safety window. Um, I think the applicability of where it could be used at the moment is in patients where you need to deliver long term oxygen therapy um, and you've obviously deemed that they don't need ventilatory support, um, which would be quite rare in the chronic hypercapnics, I would say. Um, if you've adequately and properly phenotyped them with a sleep study. Um, and in that group of patients, um, obviously long term oxygen therapy could be delivered during the night with the non invasive ventilation device, or it could be delivered in the day um, separate to it. Usually it's commonly used at night, but in the day, if, obviously they're meant to use it for 16 hours a day. And perhaps people don't sleep for 16 hours a day. <laughs> this group of patients sleep for perhaps a few hours at best. And the reality is they could have their long term oxygen therapy delivered through a nasal high flow device, which could be delivering beneficial effects in the day. And then you've got a group of patients that don't even tolerate their NIV. So we've really got to uh, investigate this group of patients uh, more and understand the applicability of nasal high flow in this group. And where its role lies. I hate that answer that question.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, I think if there's any more questions, is it OK if they if I could pass them through to you? If um, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, that's really good. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so this we recorded this, Anita, so we will share it at um, the presentation that's the same on Thursday. Um, and you, know, you can leave. I know you're really busy as well. And we'll go back to the programme if that's OK. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Bye. Um, jo bye bye. Joe, would you like to take the reins now and master the fire brigades um, presentations after everything before? Yay, Certainly. we're there. Uh, and uh, thank you to Claire and Paul for sending your slide packs over. Claire, um, if you would just notify me when you want me to move the slides on as you go through your talk, I will take the, you through them. If anyone can't currently see this, by the way, uh, again, please uh, pipe up. But if you could see the slides earlier on that I was sharing, you should be able to see this pack as well. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Hopefully everyone can see the screen now. Just give us a shout if you can't. And I will begin again. OK, well, thank you again, everybody, for coming this morning. My name is Claire. I'm the Safe and Well Lead for Essex County Fire and Rescue Service, and I manage a team of Safe and Well officers who work across Essex visiting the more vulnerable members of the community, offering ways to live more safely whilst remaining as independent as possible in their own homes. Today, I'm going to be sharing information about our Safe and Well Service, the impact that the rising cost of living will have on our community and our service, and our new portable misting units. If you can move along, please, Joe. Thank you. OK, so in order to drive down the number of serious injuries and fire deaths caused in accidental dwelling fires, the uh, National Fire Chiefs Council introduced home fire safety and safe and well visits into the fire service. As a brand, we are generally welcomed by people into their homes, and so we use this opportunity to risk assess individuals in their environment to mitigate risk and see what assistance or guidance we can provide. The visits are available to every resident li li living within Essex and all smoke alarms that we fit are free, including sensory alarms for the hearing impaired. Joined by operational firefighters, we have a team of volunteers who carry out home fire safety visits for the worried world well of Essex, which is people like yourselves who may just need some smoke alarms and maybe some general fire safety advice and guidance. For those more vulnerable residents, our safe and well officers carry out a more thorough risk adverse bespoke person centred safe and well visit. And for our highest level of vulnerable resident, for example, someone living with a high level of hoarding or someone living with domestic abuse, we have a safeguarding department who will provide ongoing support and work alongside other services to assist these residents. So for one reason or another, whether it's related to a mental, physical or environmental factor, most of the people we see have a greater risk of fire starting within their home or and a reduced capability of escaping if a fire were to start in their home. Our safe and well officers assess each property for signs of risk and advise on how to mi mitigate those risks. And then we assess the individual for health and wellbeing needs and advise and signpost or refer as appropriate to, to provide the right kind of support for the individual. We work alongside lots of other organisations and agencies pr to provide positive, meaningful support for residents in Essex to help them to live healthy, safe and independent lives. Some of the organisations we work alongside include the Alzheimer's Society, uh, Age UK, community voluntary services throughout Essex supporting issues like social isolation and loneliness, Essex Cares, Hearing Help, lots of energy providers, the NHS, just to name a few. Essentially, within the visits that our safe and well officers carry out, we fit regular and sensory smoke alarms for the hard of hearing. We give fire safety and crime prevention advice and guidance and give advice on health and well-being from a physical or mental illness to help with digital and socialisation amongst lots of different other subjects. They promote independence by signposting residents to organisations who can help, but for residents with greater needs who may not be in a position to find help for themselves, we refer residents into other organisations. So we can also add those, those with mobility issues to our mobilising system, as Kira mentioned earlier. Uh, people with hoarding issues and things like that. So that assist assistance can be provided in the event of a fire should a resident be unable to physically get out of their home. So this is something that we add to our system so that on route to an incident, crews um, have notification that there may well be somebody inside the property. 
So the content of the service evolves with the ever-changing diverse needs of our community and so currently our visits are focused around mitigating risk of fire and burglary, assisting those most vulnerable within aspects of health and well-being and providing guidance to those at risk of or currently suffering the effects of fuel poverty. Next slide please Joe. So just to give you a little bit of a context around our relationship with BOC, we work with BOC together when we take the safety of our residents and customers very seriously. For every installation that BOC make, they provide our Sussex County Fire and Rescue Service with details of the residents so that their address can be added to our mobilising system. This means that we are aware of the location of all oxygen cylinders and that in the event of a fire, crews are made aware that there will be oxygen stored within the premise. BOC ensures that every resident supplied with oxygen will have a working smoke alarm on each floor of their premise and if they don't they will be referred to us for a safe and well visit. Likewise uh, any vulnerable patient uh, is referred for a safe and well visit to see if there are any other ways we can help these people to live more safely within their homes. Next slide please Joe. So as we move on to the cost of living crisis and how it's likely to impact our community, uh, the effects of the rising cost of fuel have the potential to be devastating for the current and future safety and health of residents across the country. Not only will people be suffering financially, but as a result, people's physical and mental health will be at risk. It is estimated currently that 6.7 million households, which is a quarter of the population of England, are now living within the constraints of fuel poverty. Generally, fuel poverty occurs as a result of a multitude of factors, which include low income, high energy bills, poorly insulated homes, ineffective heating systems, and people having to make choices between fuel and other necessities, such as food and healthy living. We're finding that the most at risk groups are the older generation who are less able to maintain their body temperature and having an increased risk of falls, nausea, and forgetfulness. People with poor mobility, who will generate less body heat as a result of restricted movement and people susceptible to illness as the body temp as the body requires heat to fight infection. And finally, our last group will be children who with a lower body temperature may suffer reduced cognitive ability. Next slide, please, Joe. So when our safe and well officers enter the homes of our residents, they look out for the early signs of fuel poverty, and these can be signs such as the following. So Cold and drafty homes, these may be homes that have single glazed windows and doors with a lack of efficiency in keeping out the cold and keeping the warm in. Damp walls where people are unable to afford home repairs. People may, may be wearing additional clothing or having extra blankets rather than putting the heating on. And people are having, having to make choices as to whether to eat or heat their homes. And for some people, this is going to be a serious consideration. Poor hygiene, again, making choices between keeping clothes clean, having daily showers and putting food on the table and heat in their homes. And people have been unable to afford to have household items repaired or replaced, possibly adding to future risks of fires. Residents possibly being in debt and to avoid further debt, they may shut off their own fuel supplies and self restrict and residents heating their homes in unusual dangerous means, as we'll go on to find out in the next slide. Thanks, Joe. So how is the cost of living crisis going to affect Essex County Fire and Rescue Service and our visits? So without intervention, we are expecting to see a rise in accidental dwelling fires due to the following factors. People burning inappropriate materials unsafely. People using unsafe, old, disused and unswept chimneys. People using old and unsafe heaters and appliances. People, may, people being unable to afford to service, maintain or replace existing faulty appliances causing additional risk. People making poor choices and finding alternative, cheaper, less effective or dangerous means to fix faulty appliances and electrics. And people using fuel sources incorrectly or dangerously to heat their homes, such as using indoor barbecues, which will lead to CO poisoning. People heating their homes with gas stoves and possibly burning inappropriate fuels in their living spaces because they have no other choice of ways to keep their home heated. We're expecting to see a deterioration in people's health, and as a result of poor heating, poor choices and social isolation, putting a great strain on all emergency services. Next slide, please, Joe. So what we're doing to mitigate this risk on top of our usual service is offering 
residents advice on heating their home safely, effectively and efficiently. So we're promoting responsible living and the safe use of heating in the home, as I mentioned in the previous slide, advising residents to reduce their boiler flow temperature. This will effectively reduce the long term cost of their energy bills. We're providing leaflets and literature from Cadent Gas with hints and tips for ways to save energy. Signposting, signposting and referring residents, so signposting residents to individual energy suppliers to see how they can help and referring residents to warm homes and Cadent for means tested benefits. We've also produced a short leaflet with hints and tips on the do's and don'ts when it comes to the save to saving energy whilst living safely. Next slide, please, Joe. So currently we're working with lots of different organisations to train our teams up and just get as much information for, for residents as possible. Some of the organisations that we're working with and cut we've worked with for quite a long time, Priority Services Register is something that we offer and help residents with the priority services register offer extra services free of charge for residents of a pensionable age, people that are disabled or chronically sick, people with a long term medical condition, people who are in a vulnerable situation or people with hearing or visual impairments or additional communication needs. And some of the benefits of being of uh, registering with the priority services register is that if you register with one provider, you'll be covered by all providers. And people under this scheme will get advance notice of planned power cuts and priority support in an emergency. They also get uh, ongoing support and free guest safety checks. So we're also working with Citizens Advice who offer, offer warm homes discount. And the warm homes discount is a scheme delivered by all large electricity suppliers where a resident can be means tested to claim up to £150 a, one off credit towards energy costs, and this is usually your electricity bill. Some of the benefits include having an ongoing caseworker to be assigned to assist with emergency fuel help and income maximisation, things like claiming benefits, and also directly negotiating with fuel suppliers, and they are able to offer debt advice to residents as well. So alongside these organisations, we're working with Cadent Gas, they are helping us to train our staff to offer and advise residents, offer, sorry, offer advice to residents and support. We've got literature and hopefully some winter warmer packs coming that we can give out to residents. And they include things like gloves, socks, um, hot water bottles. They should be coming to us shortly and a, a small supply of seat warmers, which are literally what they sound like. They are covers for the seat that are heated by our electricity plug and they cost half a pence a minute um, and through Hayden people can go onto their website go onto the benefits calculator and see if they're actually entitled to any additional benefits from what they're receiving at the moment thanks Joe next slide please so what are the future impacts of fuel poverty so obviously one of the impacts is going to be cold homes as a result of people being unable to afford to effectively heat their homes, people are going to be more likely to develop health conditions and existing conditions may worsen. People will suffer a reduced immunity to viruses as well. Health conditions closely associated with cold homes are cardiovascular illnesses such as coronary heart disease, strokes and hypertension, respiratory illnesses such as seasonal flu, COPD, and asthma, all caused by cold and damp environments, poor mental health with stress and anxiety, loneliness and isolation being at a peak, possibly caused by people not being able to afford to socialise or invite friends and family into their homes and been unable to afford to go and visit relatives and friends and family. So the excess of winter deaths will mean that 30% of excess winter deaths, which is the difference between winter and summer deaths, are due to cold homes. On average, about 10,000 people die every year because of the homes being inefficiently heated. And the three main causes of these deaths are cardiovascular, respiratory and dementia, all affected by warmth. Next slide, please, Joe. So this brings us on to our final slide. If you could just press the play button. Thank you, Joe. So this is our portable missing unit. The following video shows a demo of a portable missing unit being activated. As you can see, the portable missing unit is a large white unit on, found on the right hand side of the screen. This unit contains 110 litres of water and has a suppression area of 16 metres squared. The fire is 
began to smoulder towards the left hand side of the room, activating the misting system at 57 degrees. On the ceiling, you can see two smoke detectors. This offers a double knock smoke alarm with false alarm prevention technology that will detect the difference between cooking cigarette smoke and smoke from a genuine fire, making activation more accurate. Once the system is confident that there is a fire, a mist is deployed to minimise damage to the property. And I'll just let that mist play out so you can hear me. Perfect. So once the mist the system is confident that there is a fire, a mist is deployed to minimise damage to the property, creating a survivable environment for a resident who is restricted to bed or chair and is unable to escape in the event of an emergency. The portable misting unit will discharge a water mist for 10 minutes, a suppression time that will allow enough time for the fire service to be alerted and crews to arrive on scene to effect a rescue. Again, I'll just let this video play out. Thank you. Joe, could you just pause the video for me, please? Thank you. So just to give you a little bit more information and context around the portable missing units, the portable missing unit is a personal protection system stopping the spread of fire and preventing smoke related deaths in the home. These units are designed to be installed in the homes of those most vulnerable residents who have a greater risk of fire starting in their home and a reduced ability to escape should a fire occur. The units are designed to be installed in the homes of those more vulnerable residents and Essex County Fire and Rescue Service have procured a stock of 10 portable missing units and will be purchasing another 10 units this year. We have a criterion for the supply and installation of each case each unit and each case is individually evaluated and assessed. Generally, a resident will be restricted to bed or chair and have other significant factors contributing to the likelihood of a fire starting at the property and the reduced likelihood of escaping the property in the event of a fire. UltraGuard has two means of alerting for a response, connection to a resident's telecare provider, for example, CareLine, or an auto dialer, which can be programmed to send a text message to up to four telephone numbers, one of which will be Essex County Fire and Rescue Services control room. By creating a survivable environment for the resident with mobility issues, the portable missing unit allows time for the emergency services to be alerted and respond quickly, saving valuable life when a resident is unable to escape unaided. Thanks, Joe. Can you move on to the next? And that's everything. So. Thank you. Any questions? Lynn? Uh, yeah, so um, how do people become eligible to have a portable missing unit? I mean, obviously they've got to have all those risks, but but you know, quite a lot of people have, have those, <laughs> those risks yeah, in yeah. place. Absolutely not a problem. So basically, um, how we assess would be through having a safe and well visit. Uh, we are in future looking towards working with partner organisations, um, so that'll be something that we can explore. But at the moment, if um, we, because we are obviously owning the systems, people would refer in for a safe and well visit, and then our officers would recommend that individual for a portable missing unit, and then we will assess and evaluate each case individually. OK, and, and are they available nationally or are they just being trialled in Essex at the moment? So, so far, um, we are aware that, bear with me a second, I've got the details, um, Cambridgeshire, Northamptonshire, Staffordshire, Derbyshire, Humberside, South Yorkshire, London, Hampshire, Lincolnshire and Nottingham, they all have misting units being used already and they've proved to save so lives. lives. Uh, we are in the process of of installing our very first misting unit in Essex. Brilliant, thank you. So there's also um, a question in the chat there. How many of these units are in use? 
in Essex, we're in the process of installing our very first unit because we haven't had them very long. But um, I believe they are being used in the other counties already. I know okay. Kieran and Paul will probably have more details about those. And Claire, did you say that you've just outlined all the areas where they have got access to these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that answers another question. Are there any concerns with the portable listing unit and electrical fires? And then also, which room do you usually site the units in? Is it in the kitchen or the room where the person's sleeping? So the units will be sited in the room where the person is sleeping. Um, the purpose of the system is that basically they're, put, they're generally put in a house where somebody has mobility issues and wouldn't be able to escape in the event of a fire. So, for example, um, someone restricted a bed with uh, oxygen use, maybe using emollients and smoking, a heavy smoker, we would tend to put uh, one in their bedroom, obviously, because they that is their main living space. Um, if they were to move to other rooms and a fire took hold in the bedroom, it obviously would hopefully suppress the fire, but it wouldn't give them necessary protection because they're not in that room. So the purpose is if they can't, if their their main living space is one room or one chair, one bed, we would generally put them, give them to those people who who can't escape in the event of a fire. And what was the other question? About the electrical fires. So, so the mist that it gives off is so fine that it's designed to cause minimal damage to the property. I don't know if Paul yeah, okay, have you got any more information about the electrical safety of them? Yeah, I'll come in. I'll come in on this point. So when the assessment's done, the siting of the equipment is done to support the needs of the environment. So it will be sited appropriately. If there are any sort of mitigating risk factors within that space, then they look at where the site deployment of the, the piece of equipment is done appropriately. So if we consider that person's higher risk habit might be in the front room living space on an armchair uh, that has a lot of electrical sockets nearby and that, then we look at appropriate means of isolating certain supplies of electricity, um, sort of blank plates on sockets so that the water can't creep into those spaces. But if it was something where, you know, in that room, say it was a very small bed sit area or something like that, um, we'd make sure that the direction of travel for the mist would be directed away from any significant electrical supplies such as the mains unit coming into the property, but also the kitchen area as well. It's something that is put in place to mitigate the serious uh, uh, injury or fatality of the individual. And uh, mostly in, in, in most fire occurrences anyway, electricity is one of the first things that will be knocked out from that fire occurring. And, you know, within the regards to the misting system put, being put in place, it's one of those risk balances that you take of where you recognise that it's saving life and giving that survival atmosphere, and then the knock-on effect of that would be secondary to preserving life. I know it sounds very sort of chicken and the egg scenario, but it's all done in that assessment to, to make sure that we're not increasing risk for the individual and that we're there providing them a breathable survival atmosphere until emergency service response can attend. Thank you, Paul or Claire, for this one. Have there been incidents where the unit has been deployed inappropriately? And linked with that is another question to say, have they ever gone off accidentally? So when you say deployed inappropriately, um, all of these sightings of these systems have gone through sort of a, a triage process and assessment with every fire and rescue service. So what it would do really, to give you a sort of a generic case study, if there are incidents of where there's been repeated calls of fire incidents or near misses for individuals, let's take perhaps somebody who has um, a, a drinking habit and then they uh, smoke heavily whilst drinking and they tend to fall asleep on an armchair or, or in a settee in, in an environment like that. The, the case building up to that would be the evidence to provide that this needs to be put into that space um, to support that uh, opportunity not occurring again. So when we talk about uh, inappropriate sort of use, that's really mitigated in the triaging beforehand. Um, there has been incidences of where people uh, have mental health, where uh, they've damaged uh, the um, equipment as well, thinking that it's it's not right, it shouldn't be there. These are all Everything we do in that assessment, it's done in a sort of a, 
a multi-agency approach, having everybody there, the percep perceptions of all, all the uh, agencies involved in supporting the individual to make sure that it's the right solution. And please be aware, it's not a solution that goes in place and then we can sort of brush our hands and walk away and say, that's fixed that. It's part of an action plan to increase either the change in the environment, behavioural change for the individual, or a solution towards looking to reducing and mitigating that risk in that moment. Um, the actuation of the units as well, because Claire mentioned before the two knock system, what that allows us to do, the first knock is that it's been actuated. The second knock will be if it increases in temperature, um, if the fire, if it's sort of uh, down to a cooking experience, if it's like in a shared room as well, a lot of those smoke detectors, um, the only way I can sp describe it simply, it's like a nose that breathes in the atmosphere. And some of these smoke detectors are probably more pointy noses, more direct noses that can identify the difference between, well, this is a fire that needs to be responded to, so it will do the double knock, or this is just an occurrence of where they've burnt some toast and now the atmosphere is cleared. Um, Paul, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, or you may not be, Lincolnshire apparently used these last year, then stopped uh, due to maintenance and also issues where they have gone off inappropriately and yep. immobile patients were given hypothermic and drenched from them. Yeah, these are one of the causations, I think, with anything that we put in place, we have to be acutely aware of a change in the environment or equipment. We have followed the National Procurement Framework for the National Fire Chiefs Council where they have identified all the requirements around what that supplier um, can do with regards to the equipment that we provide or we support in providing. I think in, in, in sort of case studies such as this, where we're looking at actuations of units, it's much the same as our fire risk. When we um, do things around electrical fire safety, we gather many different incidents across the UK of where, say, a particular brand of washing machine or tumble dryer might have occurred in say five or six areas across the UK. We bring that in, we do our studies, and then we act appropriately to, to with regards towards what messages we send out or what we need to consider in our locality. Is this something that's going to have a regular occurrence? You know, we do speak to each other nationally and regionally as fire and rescue services. And I think what's happened in um, Lincolnshire, I think you said, we are reviewing that and we're looking at that to make sure that A, is that likely to occur in our environment? Was it a maintenance issue with regards to what that looked like? Was it from the supplier or a third party? Uh, is the equipment the same as our equipment? Um, there's many factors and variables associated with sometimes things going wrong. And I think for us, you know, we're in a position of where we've tested this, we've had confirmation, we've been across fire and rescue services nationally, we've looked at what they're doing, what's in place, we've looked at the permutation and the variables around putting these in place, um, whether it's in shared partnership or whether that's us actually owning the equipment and then the maintenance is taken over by, say, the housing provider or the people that are providing that care for the person. There's many different factors to, into this, but we consider in the balance of saving life uh, where people are more vulnerable and at risk due to the associated uh, layers around them that we're still moving forward with this. Thank you, Paul. And if we just take, um, Kieran had his hand up and then we'll move on yep. to Paul, your presentation. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on the Lincolnshire point. I had a conversation with them about uh, their situation. Uh, my sense is that, that when you install one of these, it's a major control measure. And like any other major uh, or technological control measure, you, you don't just, we can't be installing these things and then just sort of swanning off into the sunset and thinking that's, that's a job done. And so particularly, uh, with these, we're really interested in how this plays out in Essex and making sure that we've got a proper structure around the, their provision. So uh, when they activate, who knows, how do we contact people to let them know? How do we get in there and stop an activation if it's not a true activation? And responding on blue lights to any activation, whether or not it's a fire as well. So there's a whole kind of process around the response in Essex that's about making sure that, you know, we're responding uh, to any activation to make sure that we've we've checked it, and so you don't get a situation where some where uh, a unit goes off and an individual is um, is laying wet uh, for an extended period of time. So um, I think what I'd say is there's control measures we've put in place to avoid that situation. Some of that will be maybe um, strengthened with learning from Lincolnshire as that comes through, 
but um, I think we've I think we're in a good place in Essex and most of the rest of the country. Thank you, Kieran. OK, we'll hand over to you now, Paul, to do the last um, session of this morning. Thank you, Claire. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, in true fire brigade fashion, Joe, you're an honorary firefighter. You've improvised, adapted and overcome to make sure that we can share this presentation with everybody today. So um, I'm the inclusive prevention and partnership manager in our prevention team in Essex Fire. And I'm going to share with you now what's going on in that space. You've heard some stuff from Claire and Kieran. Um, but just to give you some wider context and what's on the horizon for us in our relationship with our health partners. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So for many years, there's been a recognition that there are commonalities of prevention across our two areas of fire and health in our communities. The emergence of fire safe and well offer, what Claire shared with you, identifies opportunities in those commonalities. And there's been a national drive and support for our, from the NFCC uh, right down to local level enabling each fire and rescue service to create a product that delivers meaningful engagement in our communities. And this not only supports our fire and safety risk intervention messages, but also supports the health and well-being of our citizens. I use the analogy of uh, consultants and GPs when explaining what we do in Essex Fire with our safe and well delivery. We are the consultants on fire and home security. Now we're able to give home security advice as we are trained with accred accreditation from Essex Police. And this has been developed through our relationship of being governed by the Police and Fire Crime Commissioner of Essex, which links our services into greater collaboration. But we are also those GPs in that visit, considering the wider health and wellbeing environment, and, and, and that allows us to signpost to other available experts. And we're connected with it and, we re and referred to a range of services such as Claire shared with you, and those offer solutions and signposting to those experts, those other consultants in our communities. And this enables us to refer to the appropriate support at that moment, identified through our conversations with the people we're having in our communities that are receiving our safe and well visit service. Next slide, please, Joe. So historically for us in Essex Fire, we've often delivered at our targeted risk intervention to support either at crisis or after a significant event, such as a serious injury or fire death. And our business as usual activities would primarily focus on our high risk category cohort, these being aged per over 65. We have, however, seen a noticeable rise in our serious and fatal fire incidents over the past few years. And Karen shared, uh, Kieran shared that with you earlier. But our findings expose there's been a drop in the age of victims that are experiencing these uh, incidents. So as part of our integrity and drive in finding solutions in reducing avoidable, serious and fatal fire outcomes, we discovered the power of our data. And we did this through academic partnerships, which allowed us to deep dive, to focus outside of our usual suspects that we often measured fire risk occurrences against. And these were causations such as smoking, candles, electrical, you know, these are just to name a few. But this deep diving enabled us to explore more about the person, their living space, and what may have influenced them becoming more vulnerable, as well as the causation, um, which Kieran shared with you earlier. But this data discovery, it picked out so much information for us. And as well as the data we already know of the commonalities where we knew which month, which day of the week, which time of day, where, where fires would often occur. We also discovered though, what type of housing tenure was more likely to experience fire. The influence of the occupant's age and health variables associated with that type of fire. And the capacity of the individuals where cognitive and physical capacity had an impact. But also, as Kieran mentioned earlier, the number of persons living in a property when overlapped with the previous discoveries would also affect their risk. Interestingly for us as well was the financial impact, considering the amount of money being bought into a home and the effects that would have presented some previously unnoticed data to us. So did you know that a family in Essex with £12,000 income annually is nearly four times more likely to have a fire than that of a home bringing in £40,000 uh, a year. And this data deep dive, it wasn't measured against areas of deprivation where we expect the socioeconomic impact and health inequality hotspots to appear, which do increase risk. It was captured across all of our incidents across Greater Essex. And this exposed other areas not showing up in that heat mapping of deprived areas where financial poverty affected the occurrences, occurrences of those incidents, not the locality. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. 
So our inquisitive mindset led us to dig further into discovering what the likelihood of fire was and the likelihood of that person escaping, as well as those additional factors. But particularly important for us was considering the physical impact, mental and environmental influences being experienced by poor health for an individual, not just their age. So to truly understand this, we utilised our connections and invited ourselves to the table of those in the health environment. This allowed us to be more informed and where appropriate, inform also. This exposed the cohorts which overlap in our different spaces of fire and health. The terminology, the measures and systems in place in health have provided us knowledge and confidence to explore opportunities. And fire, we can utilize these and provide solutions in, uh, such as in commonality of capturing information that is usable across the work we do with health. An example of this is where we use the frailty scoring method, the Rockwood scale. We are currently working with some pr local primary care networks and the joint use of this method will enable us to not only benefit ourselves, but also the health partners involved. And this is from an opportunity to capture the, capture the person's score whilst we engage with them. And this will provide a reflection of where the, that individual may be improving or declining in that score outside of a health intervention opportunity. It will also allow us to measure vulnerability more easily and widely outside of our usual age-related cohort method that is usable across two of our spaces, health and fire. Next slide, please, Joe. Our relationship with BOC and the outcomes that is delivered is one of the successes we have had experienced in the health space. It's a really good example of collaboration in delivering effective services and a mutually beneficial outcome in a very high risk environment that supports those experiencing challenges in their day to day abilities. Our collaborative space has evolved and it includes other organisations in the health environment. This has gifted us opportunities to look beyond what we first identified as being beneficial to both BOC and Essex Fire at the beginning of our work back in 2020. We are very fortunate to have like-minded organisations around the table with us, which specialise in, in, in the home oxygen environment and to walk alongside us in our communities. This has allowed us to educate each other and help to discover the most at risk from our different perspectives. This approach delivers meaningful prevention intervention and reduces demand on our services at crisis. But our relationship with BOC has lots of other benefits as well. During a large fire near the BOC Harlow depot, uh, depot earlier this year, BOC services were significantly impacted in both receiving and delivery, delivering critical oxygen supplies to service users and medical sites. Utilising our partnership network contacts, BOC's James Phillips and myself were able to facilitate safe passage of services for BOC during fire, firefighting operations taking place. And this enabled urgent oxygen, uh, emergency oxygen supplies to continue. Our Chief Fire Officer, Rick Hilton, shared his thoughts through our staff uh, work plus platforms that we have, congratulating all involved. And I particularly liked the great fire service comment he used, but there again, I am slightly biased towards Essex Fire, having worked for them for 29 years. Next slide, please, Joe. So in the wider health environment, I find myself as a pioneer as I was encouraged to be in my role. Through my exploration and horizon scanning, populating myself locally, regionally and nationally, it's allowed me to develop relationships in health. And that investment has provided us opportunities. We're, we are now connected in many areas in the integrated care systems across the County of Essex, these being Mid and South Essex Health uh, and Care Partnership, Hertfordshire and West, Sussex, uh, West Essex, and Suffolk and North East Essex. In these spaces, we are working with primary care networks to generate visits to the needles in the haystack individuals, which we have difficulty connecting with before crisis. We are currently exploring potentials such as the discharge from hospital to home support, ensuring the property is assessed and checked for the safe return of the individual. And as Kieran mentioned before, we are delivering free fire safety awareness sessions for health staff and other roles in the community who engage with people in their homes. This enables them the confidence and the knowledge to recognise the at-risk individuals of fire and that they are linked through into their work 
to be referred into our Safe and Well Home Visit Service. To date, over 350 people have attended our sessions, which has enabled more referrals of at-risk individuals to us at Essex Fire. And then there's regionally and nationally. We're in many places being informed and informing. Subjects such as population health and place management developments and public health management approaches. We're sharing commonalities in the cohorts and we're signposting to other fire and rescue services for health to link into within their localities. And these are enabling us to discover and deliver collaborative services and positive intervention community engagement across our county with our health partners. Next slide, please, Joe. So hopefully today you've learned a little of what we do uh, and considering our work in prevention and health from Kieran, Claire and myself. I would describe us as the three amigos, but we are much more than three in our prevention team. Our one team approach within Essex Fire Prevention enables all of our staff to be valued and valuable in our work. We can all be considered as the voice of the SATNAV in our direction of travel at different points along our journey. Diversity of thought is encouraged in our department for our considerations in our aims and objectives and the work we do. Along with the integrity and support of our service leadership, this gives us the executive sunshine that makes our prevention space grow. And these are the golden threads and the foundations of making people safer in our communities for our prevention work. Next slide, please, Joe. So still wearing my pioneer hat, I truly see health as our northern star, guiding us to occasions of reducing risk and incidents involving those more vulnerable and at risk in our communities. Creating opportunities of co-partnership work with like-minded people in supporting prevention, intervention and workable solutions is extremely valuable to our communities. They can develop an, uh, sorry, they can develop a notable reduction in avoidable and unnecessary use and of demand on future services needs for crisis intervention and incidents that result in significant harm. These are all benefits for, for those in our communities that are experiencing significant health impacts or those that may be unaware or, or spiraling into that space of risk and also for the benefit for all the organisations delivering those services. Now, partnerships strengthen our communities. They attract positive solutions from different perceptions, which improves well -be the, the well-being uh, in our citizens' lives. Next slide, please, Joe. So now you know, it's not just getting cats down from trees or putting out fires that a good fire and rescue service can, can become. A great fire and rescue service does a lot of things. But I also want to point out that no animals were hurt in the taking of this picture, although I can't confirm the person getting them down didn't require medical attention. Next slide, please, Joe. So our appearance at this education event was another partnership benefit that brings opportunities to support our communities, or as I like to call them, magic moments. So thank you to James, Claire, VOC and Joe and everyone else involved in providing this opportunity and allow us a platform to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you, Niall, and thank you everyone in the audience today, um, especially thank you for bearing with us through our pe presentation issues that weren't there yesterday, I have to be honest. Um, but yeah, we're not technical as kids and we got there in the end. Um, and I hope you have enjoyed all of the presentations from this morning. I think we'll send out um, a forms by the end of the week just to just to get your feedback and for future topics and things but um, I hope you can see really good collaboration uh, partnership working which is what we strive to do and keep doing so I think this is well, Paul I don't know is it year three or four working together on the education event uh, I think this is year three yeah we've um, we've always been involved regionally with BOC but myself and James after a conversation at one of those meetings decided that we'd meet locally because there was a gap and we wanted to, to sort of really focus on this high risk and then that that's just evolved and it's been, been one of my favorite partnerships i'm not just saying it because i'm here but we have so many benefits i, I can give you another example i was delivering to a, a hospice um st luke's hospice in essex 
and questions came up about home oxygen. So I introduced them to James and now James, I think whether he's been down there yet, I don't know, will be presenting to their home care team, but also to their staff, mitigating some of the misunderstanding around the use of home oxygen and what's the best solutions for that. So it is just, there's so much benefit coming from this. We shadow some of the home team from BOC, they shadow our, our, our staff that go out and deliver safe and well visits. And it's been a really, really lovely, fruitful friendship that's absolutely put us all at the next level of giving a really good customer service. Yeah, I'd like to see it as sort of gold standard. So if there's anything that um, we can do or Paul's team can do to help um, in influence or talk to your local services or if there's anything, any ideas that you want or just to pick up that relationship, certainly in East Mids, Nile would be your link there and anywhere else in East of England, James would be more than happy to um, based on the good um, network and friendships we've got with the fire service in Essex. So I think that we've got given you the gift of about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so back to you. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, for a really good morning, really good question. So we're repeating this session on Thursday with Anita's presentation recorded. Um, and then we will be putting this up on the portal for any of your colleagues or anyone else that you think would benefit from watching this. So with that, I bid you a very good Tuesday afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much.